Hey everybody, this is Jason Bosch, and I'm here with super friends, <laughs> Allison McDowell, <laughs> Lynn Davenport, and Leo Saracino. And um, yeah, I don't know if we've all been together at once. This is this is new. Um, yeah, so Allison had put together a, a playlist here. So complexity, emergence, and the networked commons, networked commonings. So yeah, I thought we uh, we would just go through these clips and, and chat about them. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Do yeah, you can I pop in do, for a second? Wanna, yeah, do you want to say something? Yeah, so this sort of builds on the conversation that Jason and I had uh, last week or so ago about sort of steering consciousness and managed consciousness. And uh, we it was looking at this guy, pa Patrick Ryan, and his idea of human weather systems and engineering story and using uh, grammar fields. And then it, that overlapped with a, a consultant in complexity theory, this guy, Dave Snowden, who is a Welsh guy who spent a lot of his early career at IBM uh, doing systems innovation and then did consulting around management of complex systems. And uh, he had like something called, I think, Kinevin, Kinevin, um, it looks like Sinofin and someone pointed out it looks like cybernetic uh, finance network, which is kind of interesting. Um, and but he calls it Kinevin. Kine and then th he had a new uh, version of systems engineering called estu Estuarin. It's very hard to say, but like an estuary, like the flow of a tidal river and marsh systems. And essentially with this idea that depending on um, what you should do is design a landscape so that the energy would preference the outcomes you want to happen. And so it's less about putting energy and forcing the system than creating the conditions in which quote unquote good things, <laughs> whoever gets to decide what the good things are, will just will come about by sort of algorithmic weighting and systems engineering. And so after that, a couple of people dropped uh, two additional names. And I always, I really do appreciate you know, being able to collaborate with people who are on the same sort of in the same mental workspace. And so uh, two names were brought up, uh, Benjamin Bratton, who it turns out uh, is a, a program manager with the Bergruen Institute. And I've written a lot in the past about Nicholas Bergruen based in Los Angeles, the philosopher king wannabe, <laughs> former hedge fund or venture capitalist wannabe philosopher king uh, magician. And um, and uh, and then someone else uh mentioned uh, this woman, uh, Alicia, I think you pronounce it, Cuarero, who is uh, originally from Cuba and very much involved. He, she works with Dave Snowden um, and uh, in the systems analysis, but what she calls enabling constraints. And when I heard enabling constraints, I was like, okay, so that's the protocol layer. And the reason I wanted to sort of bring everybody together um, uh, to, to talk about it cause it was because I think we all have different perspectives. So like Jason, you know, you've been sort of on the ground in, you know, with East Denver and seeing like the environment of the protocol layer rollout. And you've informed me a lot about some of the key players in that space. Um, a lot of this relates to, uh, natural systems organizations, which fits in so much with Leo's work, not only in the, the blockchaining system, but also ecology and the, this interfacing of technology and ecology and one in, each influencing the other. And then in this consciousness management, a lot of it is to around human factors engineering. So actually how we manage people in complex systems gamified, right? Game mechanics. And so the planned workforce which oftentimes people frame as like socialist or communist, but really what we're looking at is this blending of free market economics on the one hand, the, the Jeff Sandifer Acton Academies uh, with token engineering, like the planned economy through token engineering, which is something that most people are still not wrapping their minds around. And, you know, I, I had an article mm -hmm. on, on this, uh, the, the DIA app in Ukraine, and someone's like, with Samantha Powers, right? USAID, State Department. And they're like, oh, look at the communists. And I'm like, Oh, you know, like you've totally missed the point. Like this was someone I think who subscribed, like the button said they subscribed. And like, how is it that you're listening to this and you're just falling into this old mind virus trap? Like, oh, planned economy means communists or socialists. I'm like, no, 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 it's tokens, guys. And so I was hoping like all of us and, and you know, C Cliff is still recovering, but he had some interesting perspectives I might chime in on. We've talked in the past about like energetic contracts because this is all posted against this idea that everything in the world has a digital identity, human and non-human. And uh, 
I guess, I don't know if it goes for non-human entities, but this idea of soul binding, soul bound tokens. And this, so, so then there's also a sacred spiritual part. So I think we all have these different perspectives and that's why I, I pulled a rather long playlist. I'm not sure we'll get through all, you know, me, I'm always overly ambitious before, but my goal was really to hit on again, this impact finance, the protocol layer, game mechanics and gamification and, um, like with the token engineering around these quote unquote social systems, technical systems, um, also natural systems. So it's socio-technical, cyber-physical people and nature. And then I really feel like this is moving us towards a hybrid, bio-hybrid super intelligence. That the singularity is, I'm, I'm increasingly feeling that it's not about machines attaining consciousness. It's about integrating us at various levels through our consciousness, through our biology with nanomechanics and through uh, cybernetic coordinating systems, both financial, governance, uh, cybernetics, into as nodes in, in the super intelligence. So um, I don't know if any of you guys have anything you want to chime in on before we kind of jump in. But that that's my thinking. That's why I wanted to build off of what we did about consciousness and introduce these two new characters. Benjamin Bratton uh, is one. And then really the emphasis is on Alicia Juarero. Uh, again, ties to Cuba. So it's interesting when, like, if you were as we all were swimming around in the old ideology at the beginning of this, you're like, huh, Cuba, they're going along with this whole thing too. That's unusual. Well, not so much, not if they're a testing bed for, for some of these complex systems emergence. Well, and I so know anyway, Miami is, is real big on, uh, you know, a lot of this tech is, is really exploding in, in Miami as well, so. Yeah. And she's based in Miami mm -hmm. too, you know, University of Miami. Right. Bienvenido uh, a Miami. <laughs> That's all. Well, do we do we want to start uh, with the one video that you sent the introduction? Uh, um, well, I, I kind of have them in or oh oh yeah, oh I, I guess I didn't. Um, you have this thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we could start with that. So this is about ten minutes, and essentially I pre-recorded this because I don't have screen share. Um, and and this is a map that I made uh, with the Kumu program around last year. I guess probably around this time last year. The legislation was introduced in the spring of 2022 around uh, trust frameworks and digital identity. Um, uh, and, and, and this was when I was writing this, it was sort of blending with the rollout of the Soulbound Token papers later in the sun, last summer. All right. And text for uh, Benjamin Bratton, who is uh, part of the Bergruen Institute and working on this anti-Kathera project of sort of speculative synthetic futures. Uh, so I wanted to sort of, I've written uh, quite a bit about the Bergruen Institute and um, Nicholas Bergruen was a former uh, venture capitalist who uh, then removed himself from that field and became a, aspired to become a philosopher king uh, and was being trained in uh, early modern European magic and public policy. Uh, and was very involved in, has been very involved in China as well. And I came upon the Bergruen Institute while I was doing research on the California Senate bill for the trust framework of digital identity uh, about, I don't know, I guess a year ago, a year or so ago, so in uh, spring of 2022. And uh, it was introduced by this gentleman, Robert Hertzberg, who was uh, the majority leader of the California Senate at the time. And there was a lot of uh, lobbying on behalf of this trust digital identity bill uh, coming from various quarters, uh, in including um, Tony Rose was representing in Input Output Hong Kong and Cardano, uh, Block, which was formerly Square with Jack Dorsey, and then this Blockchain Advocacy Coalition. <clears throat> uh, pushing uh, verifiable credentials. And among the members of that blockchain advocacy group uh, was Brinley Lear, who was linked to uh, Cello and the World Economic Forum and uh, Ripple. Uh, she had been involved in uh, C-Labs, uh, which was uh, stablecoins and tokenized assets tied to their uh, mobile money apps. Um, and, and then that goes all the way back into sort of 
healthcare records management and uh, T-Mobile, Deutsche Telekom, uh, they're, they're all connected because the, the, the phone and the digital identity is your tracking mechanism in the game. Um, so this was the context that I found Bergruen, which was through Robert Hertzberg, was the, which he was the one advancing the trust framework bill in the spring of 2022. And Hertzberg had been uh, a member of the blockchain task force uh, in California. And so, you know, it's again, it's not just money. It's really digital identity is the key there. And that's so that we become agents in the game. And Hertzberg has been involved in California politics for a very long time, very much a mover and shaker. And he, in 2012, was part of something called the Blueprint to Renew California. And uh, this was something that was sponsored by Nicholas Bergruen and uh, had a number of sort of interesting individuals involved uh, from both both political parties. And, and again, that's in 2012, this blueprint to renew, which, you know, before I started to understand in complex systems analysis and emergence, I understood this as sort of a framework for what works digital government and social impact finance. Uh, but it, you know, this g gathering beyond Hertzberger included people like Eric Schmidt, um, and uh, you know Google Alphabet and Schmidt Futures. Uh, it had Eli Brode, who was quite a fixture in the Los Angeles area. He had made his money in uh, as a real estate, a residential real estate developer and life insurance. Condoleezza Rice and George Schultz. So you've got the conservatives there. Um, you have uh, let's see Antonia Hernandez, who was. Uh, connected to Ted Kennedy, working on, in the Mexican immigrant community. So th this was a very interesting um, group that was coming together to sort of remake uh, California. And among Bergruen's uh, interests was this idea of a data dividend. Um, so again, as agents in the game, that we would collect our own data on blockchain and uh, have that as an income stream. Uh, he was talking about uh, also this idea of remaking capitalism. So this is the stakeholder capitalism that is being advanced, sort of the, the blending of free market capitalism with token engineering and sort of planned economies. So trying to find the sweet spot there. And uh, so Bergruen was looking at nothing less than remaking capitalism, remaking democracy, which is such a hot button topic lately, uh, the future of democracy and, and social cohesion. Um, it, and this, this is the, the token engineering through the voting, redesigning all of our political institutions. So he's been gathering people to, to remake capitalism, remake democracy, and actually uh, in partnership with uh, Tobias Rees uh, and Reid Hoffman, formerly of PayPal and LinkedIn and AI, uh, working on something called Transformations of the Human. And this was a spinoff out of the Bergeron Institute um, and very much looking at this sort of synthetic uh, global level uh, super intelligence, right? Bio hybrid human super intelligence. So this is what the the Bergruen Institute is is about. As I mentioned, um, let's see. This is this. They have a spinoff consultancy. This transformation. Um, of the human, uh, it's a consultancy for disruptive technology, and it's embedded in uh, the Berkeley Labs at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, Department of Energy, Energy Labs, and of course we know that the, the Department of Energy and Google Alphabet is involved in uh, the Japan Moonshot Project, and and then they have all of these fellows. So you can see I've mapped them all out. Uh, there's everyone from you know filmmakers, James Cameron, uh, educational technology, uh, social entrepreneurs, and then a lot of international members, especially with an interest in philosophy and um, areas of like uh, Confucianism, which kind of goes with the smart contracting, um, and yeah, like international global policy. Uh, so, so this is sort of what Bergruen's about, and I just another part of the map I want to mention because it's sort of relevant to the Disney part um, is that Input Output Hong Kong was, uh, you know, they were consulting through Tony Rose on this California Senate bill, and if you trace it back. Um, IOHK with Cardano and Hoskinson will remember that Charles Hoskinson, who um, uh, he was partnered with Ben Gertzel uh, on this. They are close collaborators at this point, Ben Gertzel of Hanson Robotics. And Ben Gertzel's uh, focus area is uh, the um, uh, the AI, the mind of the Sophia and Grace, the robots, uh, and, and actually they're, they're the 
logo for Hanson Robotics is a hexagram. Uh, but then, of course, we remember that the uh, his his partner in developing the the humanoid robotics is David Hansen, and David Hansen does the animatronics, and he came out of Disney, and so this idea of understanding Disney as part of sort of imagining alternative futurities, uh, animatronics, extended reality, brand building, um, guided experiences. Uh, and Disney really overlapping with the future of quote unquote online learning, uh, this partnership for 21st century learning, when we're imagining a future where young people are trained up with playlists of curated digital media, that essentially we're inviting um, the next generations in to live inside extended reality that's that's governed by um, multinational corporations and the military. Um, so it's it's just important to understand. And then all of this is going to be running on tokens. And that's where the, the, the Gertzel... Um, uh, Hoskinson collaboration sort of comes into play. So I just wanted to to emphasize this uh, aspect of the Bergruen Institute and then find that I found out about it within the context of California digital identity and their focus on um, at the state level, California, but then uh, de remaking democracy, uh, remaking capitalism again with token engineering and big data and then using that data uh, and impact finance and what works digital government to transform humans into a global synthetic um, biohybrid superintelligence for some sort of com computational purpose that I'm, I'm, I'm not fully aware of. Oh, and I will just mention too, one of the, the people who was connected with the, the transformations of the human, uh, Nina Be Begus and Gabriel Gabriel Corin, uh, they, oh, it was, no, it was actually, they have connections to this thing called the Brody Lab, uh, which is, uh, Owen Brody at uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs. He's a biogeochemist. And he was looking at uh, modeling earth systems and watersheds. And he was actually had a specific pro project in uh, Colorado, a watershed. So I would say when I first mapped that out, I wasn't really clear about how the watershed aspect fit into things. But as we look at the discussions of uh, David Snowden's uh, Knevin, Knevin and uh, Alicia Warrero's emphasis on uh, energy landscapes and designing game boards to uh, preference certain outcomes to make certain outcomes more likely uh, in energy flow systems in our gamified reality, I, I think we can start to see how modeling uh, the earth systems um, and the ecosystems uh, with, in partnership with the Department of Energy, which is Leo has done a lot of work and research on that long history of using radioisotopes to track and trace uh, ecological energy exchanges uh, that it, that's all starting to come together in complex systems analysis. Cool. <laughs> Isn't, Isn't it, it amazing what they can accomplish? It's so cool. <laughs> I love science. Um, yeah. Wow. That's, right. that's like so succinct. That's like, it's, okay. it's, yeah, you, it's, it's really no, coming together sorry. there. I know. I went back and I looked at the map and I'm like, it's all right there. Like, but if you don't have the proper, like, conceptual framework, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what's up with the watershed? Like, I know water is important. I know. But why is the Department of Energy working with the, you know, Livermore Labs and the transformations of the human? What is it about that? And it's it is about energy flow. And it makes me think a lot, Leo, about the whole like permaculture and soil and those like, totally. because it's fractal. Like, I think a lot of us are used to thinking of like, oh, if something's happening on a molecular level, like it, it's only relevant at a molecular. And I'm like, no, those molecules like can be extrapolated as agents, right? Like, you know, fungi and, you know, other, you know, in elements like soil is so complex that when you start to think about it, if you modeled each of those molecules as like agents and then extrapolated the interactions of those agents onto people or societies, like they're, they're probably figuring out a lot of patterns there. Right. I see. So it's like, yeah, by watching how the molecular dynamics and then into the ecosystem and other organisms, it gives them patterns yeah. in order to understand people and because nature is so complex and it stuff. just does it, you know, like it just does. I mean, not just, but like it's what's happening before people started messing around in there. Right. And so they can like unlock that as a key. I feel like that's something that they want to do. What did you find out about? Uh, I was interested to see. I've always been a fan of the James Cameron 
you know, filmmaker, but I haven't seen his new film, The Way of Water, which is about water, but like oh. uh, the, the Avatar film. I haven't watched it. Mm-hmm. I've heard it. I've heard it's very long. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it makes me think of, too, what you're saying, Allison. The, so there's this one group, the um, ESMC, the Ecosystem Services Market Consortium, that was it's mostly it's like technically a nonprofit, but mostly funded from an organization that was created by the 2014 um, like farm bill and they are like building up the they're they're kind of doing the first like larger scale ecosystem services programs in like just rural agriculture it's like sorghum wheat cotton Mm -hmm. and like larger farmers and they're also funded by um, like General Mills, McDonald's, uh, I think Bayer is also found Kellogg's. in Monsanto. Yeah, Kellogg's, I think, is also Kellogg's there always too. in there. Yeah, <laughs> and just like some of the, you know, some of the largest <laughs> Part companies of a complete around breakfast. this space. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so like the, and what the ecosystem services, like, program's all about is like monitoring certain aspects of the land like the organic matter in the soil or the water quality and then like calculating all those statistics and then like having a financial reward for the farmer based on like the changes in metrics so you know it's pretty much this like kind of very similar thing to like Lawrence Livermore studying the watersheds and the water dynamics is that they're doing that for managed agriculture so instead of just like the like natural mm-hmm. watershed understanding those physical patterns and the water flows is seeing how all that happens like in places of more like intensive human machine activity yeah, engineered. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And steer. Well, then it is interesting mm-hmm. to think about the next phase of agritech being like warehouse based, right? So you're mm-hmm. like taking things <clears throat> into a more and more engineered status. I mean, with the robotics, like with the removal of human factors from the equation and like creating constraints. Like, you know, you, you, you can, you know, you, you, if you remove the, production of commodities from the land where they're subject to weather, which they're already engineering, right? But you put it in a warehouse where you can control all of the things, but it, it's going to totally lack any sort of like spirituality, right? Or connection, like the larger, it's abstracted. It becomes more and more abstracted from. Totally. And I feel like well, this probably. Leo, you mentioned the farm bill. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, that's a delay. You mentioned the farm bill and that that made me think of when I was watching some of the parts of Allison's map is that the the legislation that is tied to this and policy that comes before it and the policy funded. So it's it's a it is a, an entire e- another kind of ecosystem where the all of those things are you know the manufacturing or the um, where they're trying to steer in a certain the manufactured agriculture or the manufactured whatever the 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 thing is that they're trying to steer and control a lot of that starts through policy and a lot of that behind the scenes is funded by some of the same players who are uh behind the impact investing so it, it's a lot of people don't see that they think of policy as being something that's organic and it's just not yeah, yeah. I, also when i look at these maps you know one things i like about them is that a lot of these things I was talking to Alice earlier about, like some of these things might seem on the surface, like just not connected with one another, you know, not like, connected. oh, there's mm-hmm. this thing that's going over here. And then there's this thing that's going over here. But what do they have to do with each other? Some of them on the surface seem very disparate, like, OK, the study of, uh, you know, uh, nature and how it, it it operates. But then the, then these people studying cybernetics and actually putting human beings into these kind of complex systems that are managed and steered. So I, I think that that's really helpful. The, those maps you're putting together, Allison. Yeah. Well, they yeah, kind of tell be, you, you know, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, it's yeah. like, you wouldn't be thinking that 
some of the earliest ecological research would be coming like pretty much hand in hand with like right after like, nuclear development. Or, yes, totally. Or, it's, it's like literally, and Monsanto too, is they, they were running right. the labs or, originally. And it's like, oh, okay, so we have Monsanto to thank for environmental science pretty much. I mean, yeah. it's a sort of a stretch, but kind yeah, of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and Exxon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was just down in uh, Los Alamos and I went <laughs> to the learning pod and new new meaning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry. No, sorry. But I, I was just down in Los Alamos and like I would have even you go to the museum, they don't this part of it's not, you know, like the parts that, that Rio, Leo's researched uh, yeah. is, is they, they don't include that in the museum. <laughs> oh. They don't right. say, did you know that Los Alamos runs the Human Genome Project? It's amazing. Like the Manhattan Project just turned into the Human Genome Project, right? <laughs> Boom. Like they don't well, they don't point that out. <laughs> no. Well, they do a little bit with Oak Ridge for um, like radio for in medicine specifically. Right. Mm. Like I feel like that's pretty. You know, they like to talk about that for radioisotopes and like radi like targeted radiation therapy and stuff. And, yeah. Well, and, and they also, they give you just a little bit of information to legitimize something else they're doing with it. Like the little known statistician who uh, is now, well, he's, he's deceased, but he was tied to the, the mm. uh, Oak Ridge studies, but also Bill Sanders, but also value added models for teacher performance. Mm. Huh? Go figure that that all. Yeah. So they, they legitimized him like, oh, he's so smart. He was studying cows and and all of this in Oak Ridge and then the atomic that's where the the atomic bomb studies all that was done and so then he's suddenly an expert in teacher to in the in studying teacher performance hmm. wow. well, and Did I, I want to right point Allison, out about the atomic yeah. piece <laughs> yeah well I didn't get into well and the thing is you know what I was saying early on that that what's coming is that those computer models of effectiveness like of impact are going to be for the computer programs, not human teachers. Like, so when early on, when I was doing my advocacy work in education, like the teachers would get in a huff and say, well, we're not, it was like pay for performance. Right. And people are like, well, we don't go into Mm -hmm. teaching. Like we teach as well. Like we teach at our top level. We don't teach better because we get an incentive bonus, right? You, you teach because it's your calling and you're, we're already doing it. We're not going to teach less well and get, you know, we, we can't step up and then, but that is going to work with the computer program and they're going to use it for the, what works, you know, social impact, like, oh, this, you know, this program raises scores, this percentage, this program raises scores for this subgroup. And it's all a part of the modeling yeah. exercise, but people can't get their headspace. And I want to point out on the map, I didn't bring this up, but Gavin Newsom wasn't on that re- remake California committee, but he did present to them. And there was stuff around workforce aligned education. And the guy Bonderman from TPG Capital was part of the group. He was from Fort Worth. So there was a Texas outlier in in that remaking California group. Like, why is a guy from Fort Worth on on the group, Um, Bonderman? But there was an emphasis on workforce development. And again, California and Texas have the most children. Um, They particularly have the most children living in low income situations. They probably have the highest percentage of like immigrant children, non uh, English primary um, you know, as their primary mm-hmm. language. So those are all setups for impact interventions with technology. And and California had some of the earliest organized databases of sort of cradle to career workforce pipeline studies. And, and in fact, along with the digital identity uh, legislation, there was an element of a blockchain education transcript that that was those were stuck at the hip with this trusted identity layer. So management of human capital into that, like we have to understand it as the gaming agents, like they're 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 categorizing us as units to be managed in a game. It's going to be it was going to happen through economic incentivization. But within that, within the tech, it's going to be also consciousness management, right? Human weather. And, and it's it's interesting to me because Sandifer, with his Acton Academy and his free market leanings, you know, he came out of Austin and the wildcatters, right, the oil wildcatters, his pitch with all these micro schools is the hero's journey, right, is the quest. It is uh, micro schools with decentralized, um, you know, multi-age units where 
you know, the teacher is the guide on the side and not the sage on the stage. And the kids are all pursuing their quest largely. I mean, at this point, there's a lot of screen time, but soon it's going to be wearables. It's going to be wearables with your digital identity that's going to be mirroring their social activities into the thing for the free market. Like this guy is total free market guy, right? He's like, oh, we're not doing the bad China kind. We're doing the free market American kind, right? But the quest in terms of consciousness management, if they can frame quote unquote education with Disney scale branding on blockchain and playlists of you to literally live action role play your way through the game, to uh, you know, earn your points or whatever, that's all going to be part of these energetic landscapes, and it's and and and, and mm-hmm. with soul bound tokens for goodness sake. So, I just I, I like Lynn, your piece being situated in Dallas is so important because I feel like you know Jason just forwarded that information about these labs, GSV setting up a lab, um, you know, in in yeah. a tech lab well, they- with the biology. Whatever well, happens to that bill. You know, I have to go back and see what what ended up with the bill because I should have looked that up before we started today. But I don't remember if it. I think the education piece got dropped off. So, like, I think they let some things go. Um, I, you know, I think it passed, but it might have been a study. Like, it might have been like not that everyone's going to get assigned a digital identity, but like it was legislation to study the development of the trusted identity. Okay, I also just found out recently that in Vermont here they. I think it was from their 2016 or 17 legislation about, it was kind of more like business regis- um, like business regulations for blockchain companies that the, mm-hmm. some of the first, like one of the first DAOs is like being incorporated legally is in Vermont here. And like before Wyoming yeah. or any of that is called D-Org. And it's like literally the, like the, if you go on, uh, it's like a, open law and look up d.org and then you can see like their statutes for how the basically smart contracts interfa- inter- interfaces with the legal system so it's like the law makes it so that those there's like the things that happen on that smart contract for that organization are legally binding and like recognized as the like legitimate like, representation of that company well, and I think in the future, and this is why I framed it as like a networked commons, because so much of it is how they tell the story. And so I think that the platform commons, like the like platform cooperatives, um, and again, setting up the Ubers and these things as these really predatory systems, which they are, but then saying like, oh, we can do self-governance, right? It's setting up the era of the DAOs, the decentralized autonomous organizations. And some of those will be like, I don't know if they're going to be like some of them will pop up for a time and then go away. And some of them will have longevity with different participants, but within the hero's journey concept. Um, and again, we have to think of Joseph Campbell, like being an influence on George Lucas and Lucas's edutopia and Lucas's wife is an impact investor. I'm trying to remember her name. Um, she was at Saudi, you know, the Davos in the desert with the Saudis um, that this idea of the hero's journey and a quest it kind of fits up with the tissue, right? Like, okay, so we've got our own little guild, right? Like we're the, you know, whatever, the wrench in the gears guild or whatever. And then we go off and do our quest, you know, together. And then maybe we disassemble and some of us reassemble in different formats. And that's kind of, I think that that's reflecting this biological um, complexity that they're very interested in. It's like assembly, disassembly, reassembly, um, this agile structure. And that that's going to come through with a narrative of freedom, commons, agency, sovereignty. But it's all happening in a protocol layer where we're not actually designing the energy landscape. And this is where I think the Barrero stuff is so important is someone, something, some entity is going to be at at, at an upper level tier designing the terrain and as Kevin Werbeck always says, it's like, you know, a lot of times there's rules. We don't even know what the rules are. Like we figure them out by bumping into them and something bad happens. And then we figure, oh, that's a rule. Right. And and that they change. And so we we think that we're doing our, you know, heroic projects, but it's 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 in a in a, an environment we don't understand. Like we don't most people. I mean, I think we we're far at leaps and bounds ahead of most people in even understanding there's a game going on or what the kind of game is. But, you know, even uh, we won't know what the rules are. 
Yeah. The, yeah. The, for example, well, this, when you're... this. Oh, you go. You go. No, no. Go ahead. You go. Okay. Um, this. Yeah. The the organization here in Vermont, D Org. I know they're basically like a free, like developer freelancing network. Like they work mm -hmm. on other blockchain smart contracts, and they're like a little network of people you can like join for a little while and dissipate. So it's kind of exactly in line with what you're saying on how that's working. It's like, and they've been around, I guess, since like 2016, which is long for blockchain, yeah, blockchain. years, but it's like 50 blockchain years, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> years. Uh, blockchain years, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, the rails, but, you yeah. know, knowing that, that, that there were, you're going into this game and you don't know what the what the edges are, what the rails are, and yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not sure if there's like necessarily one group or people that know like know what the rules are because they like I'd say it's kind of a mixture of the people that create the like the infrastructure for smart contracts to exist, the like deeper level programming on the blockchain and the like Ethereum virtual machine and stuff. Um, but even then it's like, they only know so much on how things are going to happen. And then th unexpected things happen. And then at like all different scales on the smart contract and the people using them and stuff. So it's, yeah, well, there's so many different layers and I was talking to Allison, I'm trying to figure out because everybody's going on and on about the CBDCs and, um, and not actually looking at all this other stuff. And, and I, I, I know the CBDCs are going to play a very significant role. They talk about the unified ledger. I'm just not – I haven't been able to figure out how these things connect on. But, I, I you know, I see them as like uh, a, a, like a real base – I think they're going to be like a base layer. Um, they're going to offer – but but again, it's not just one layer. It's, it's layers upon layers upon layers. And each one has uh, different different powers. Jason, do you know anything about? Well, that's like why the, the. Oh, sorry, the delay is hard. I'm delayed. I yeah. know it is. I'm so sorry. Uh, but the Fed Now network mm -hmm. thing it was just released today, I think, on July first, and I don't know so much about oh, it. Oh, today like, you're like right. A, like a larger central, like um, basically more centralized uh, digital payments infrastructure run by the Fed, and that a lot, of, you know. I'm sure people have a lot of the things that they're yeah. saying about it. I just don't really know anything. Yeah, it's hard. So those to... in the, the right cool. are, are really talking about this. So I I, I kind of look at the, the two sides a lot. Um, and that is a big buzz amongst the, the prepper, maybe um, the, you know, those that are in that camp where they're thinking they need to buy land and get off the grid pull their money out of the banks that that crowd is aware of the july 1st you know the the it's basically shifting to the new currency today supposedly but that's not mainstream or it, it, you know or those in the other camp if you if you but, if we're but talking about just the two-party system yeah but they don't have the framing correct and that's the that's the problem is is that they don't actually understand right. what it is. And I'm looking at it. I'm still trying to figure out what it is, how it relates to this. But, you know, all these tokens are going to mm -hmm. be a major, a major part of the new system. So uh, anyway, so but I, I'll probably do a whole thing just well, about, and, like, yeah. yeah, I don't want to get off track here, but. Uh, no, um, I don't either, I do, I do think it's important to understand. It is. So you started out this whole talk with talking about the pipeline and those who are in the, who talk about the free market, but it's not really, uh, it's not a, 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 but it is a planned economy, but it's not the communism, socialism, and the isms that people say. It's the token engineering. And so this is, and so Jason, to answer your question, you know, how it actually, I think, is the children at the most basic, the youngest, earliest level, the children are a huge target. The schools, that's where the, the money, the the steering of the, the minds and the gamification of education, the tokenized, uh, uh, what do you call them? The uh, blockchain credentialing, all of that's coming, you know, your transcript, all your education work is now on blockchain in Dallas to be scaled nationwide. So it is, it's all connected to that, that digital ID, 
And um, so I don't know if that's helpful in making this, um, and even with the smart contracts, Leo, because those who are heavily engaged in the education reform in Dallas, one of the major lawyers who was working with all of them, traveling the country looking for their models, and that was um, the Strive Together model that, that they adopted here in Dallas. But that model, that guy is a smart, he's a, a lawyer with a firm that does smart contracts. And mm. I do think that they are setting up the new economy one by one. They're getting those on the Dallas City Council. So this, you, you can see this in every city. It's just mm -hmm. Dallas has uh, probably is more advanced maybe or further along. And because of the biotech. And so I, I don't I don't know if that's helpful to to tie it to yeah, actual. Jason, do you have the um, image that I oh, sent wow. you that the, the screenshot of the Berggruen tweet? I do. About blockchain people. Give me one. I think I think that really drives mm -hmm. it home because that was something you know when Lynn when you guys and the moms you know mostly moms were uh, really doing your testimony in front of the blockchain task force right and and these are people who mm -hmm. they're supposedly I would assume chosen for that that committee because they had some knowledge or expertise right but but they were not really even right. imagining. They weren't talking openly about the other use cases outside of the finance industry for the tokenization. And so, you know, I, I feel like this is just mm -hmm. such a telling quote, again, from Nicholas Berggruen of the Berggruen Institute, you know, the, the wannabe philosopher, king billionaire. And, you know, he's he's working on remaking democracy, remaking capitalism and remaking it what it means to be human. And I'll just read for people who are listening in this tweet from March 23rd of 2021 on Nicholas Berggruen's feed. And it has the little blue ch tick. So I guess we're supposed to believe that's really him. Uh, and this is a quote. Each individual life is an asset, valuable just by being. This as a participant in the economy, comma, and as data. In addition, everyone is likely to become a recipient of some form of universal basic income or universal basic capital in the future. And then there was a, a second quote underneath, and it continues, quote, therefore individuals could be tokenized on block on the blockchain, unlocking their potential economic value. It may sound utopian, yet it might be a financing mechanism to fund people throughout their lives if used within reasonable limits. And so this pretty much just lays it out. And, and like you would think that if someone were, a, a, you know, of a certain moral caliber were a participant on a committee for adoption of blockchain technology, blockchain identity, and, you know, a state with one of the largest economies and largest populations in the United States, that this would pause them in their tracks and say, wait a minute, tell me more about what we're talking about. Like, tell me about this universal basic income and tokenizing people. And like, where does this fit mm -hmm. in? And, and I think the very fact that we're this far down the road in blockchain years, right? And, and at this point, this conversation is still not happening because I think this is the part that's going to speak to the free market, that they want us in the brave new world yes. fashion to agree to play their game. And that they, they want us to believe that within the game, and, and this is sort of the, again, the American ethos that, you know, the bootstrap mentality that you too can be a winner in the game, right? We've made this game. You could, if you're really good, you could be a winner. Only it's all happening in virtual worlds with engineering, engineered rails, engineered protocol layers that we most people are far, far from understanding whatsoever. And then it's happening attached to a permanent record. And your permanent record digital twin is something that is essentially going to chart the course and the trajectory of what your future can be. And you never get out from under that. And that's going to start in utero with home visits, you know. And again, and then that's the liberal side because you've got the, John, you know, um, LBJ social safety net, you know, that was set up and it's not yeah. what we thought. We didn't understand what it was back then. Yeah, here we'll give you health care. We'll give you child care. We'll give you. But, you know, then we've got Mr. Luce. Oh, yeah, but we just like to have you under our watch. So we get to cream off, you know, the talent. Yeah. But mom could just drop her kid off down at the basement of Exxon and then go up to work. And it's a perfect <laughs> charter school. He's like, they got it all figured out. Thanks, Tom. We, yeah, I know. Loose lips sink ships. <laughs> That's what I say. Yeah. It's yeah, I think it was well, also just different spelling. Yeah, I had to, like, Brian, um, for, it was the former 
comptroller of the currency. I think Brian Brooks is his name. Who's bas- who's sharing that basically the same opinion as Bruguer in there, and like calling for tokenized UBI for for or I think it was specifically for education, like being paid to go to school. Um, and he, like he was participating in those World Bank education. Um, okay. Consortium for. Well, I was looking. Water and currents, so babbling brooks. Mm. Uh, what's his name? Brian Brooks. Brian, Brian Brooks. Oh, uh, water. That's Brian interesting. Brooks. Yeah, that's an interesting mm-hmm. idea of currents. Yeah, and and then waveforms. Yeah. Because I'll just say that the other thing is, you know, Leo. I know we both looked at that. Um, the book that where they were talking about the cycles, the foundation for the study of cycles and Edward Dewey, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, I can't remember, but that one chapter was so helpful of looking at waveforms across time, because all of this is happening in four, four dimensions and thinking about that as almost like a, a symphony, right? Because you've got different waveforms and different time cycles and things coming in and out. And this idea of, that's also a landscape, like that's topology, it's topography. And, you know, I I ended up going to a concert last night with this very innovative improvisational jazz percussionist who's like very well known. And uh, it's like a soundscape, too. It's like a vibrational hearing, like uh, one of these clips talks about membranes as a a site of like a transition point or the resonance chamber of a guitar and how it has this internal space and then it vibrates out. And so I feel like within the current and the current sea that, and, and the Navy and radar, right? And the oceans and all of these, the, the wave is something that, again, you've got a landscape of an ocean, both the waveform landscape, and then you've got the subsurface landscape, but then you've got the, the topology of these watersheds. And I, I, I feel like it's, even though it's so incongruous that you might think music, geology, uh, you know, microfluidics, you know, all of this, but th- that they, they are running in parallel. Like there's, st- there are some people who are studying them cross disciplinarily and trying to figure out, okay, so what are the patterning and can we fit it into the protocol layer? Can we fit it into the smart contract layer so that we then become the conductor of life on earth in t- towards some optimization metric? Now, I don't think it's just like we're going to control it so we can genocide everyone or so that we can like put you under our thumb and make you miserable, which might happen. And they don't I'm not saying that they really want to make us happy, but I think it's a control mechanism towards like a, an orchestral thing. It's some some sort of and, and even um, Guerrero t- mentioned several times, like composing and orchestration, that there, there's something that I feel like they're, they're humming the creative life force, the spiritual sacred life force of this planet into something. Now, I don't know what the it is. I don't know what the quest is, but it's feeling increasingly like that. And that's happening everything from like our gut microbiome to like cosmology and star satellites. It's happening at all these levels in between. Yeah. I haven't been able to figure that out. It's like when you even talk about (laughs) evolution or whatever, like trying to create like super organism towards some evolutionary advancement. Like, what does that even mean? Like, (laughs) I'm good. Like, (laughs) Jason, I keep thinking of all these band names as Allison's talking. She's talking about like geology and water and all this and orchestral. And I'm thinking OMD, orchestral OMD, maneuvers yeah. in the dark, and like, creates clear water. That was a band. And Rolling Leo. Stones. I'm like, maybe it was all just, or in Jefferson Starship. I don't know. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> right. I love it. They're love messing it. with us. <laughs> the Grateful Dead. Wait, what's? how does that fit in? Oh, my gosh. Wow. How, how do the Lincoln. Grateful Dead fit in? We should call up Lincoln Cannon and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that all wrapped up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Revive the dead. Yeah, yeah I, I think I'm gonna have to re mm-hmm. rethink rethink some of these bands. <laughs> mm-hmm. Band names. That's pretty mm-hmm. funny. Well, how, how what do you guys? Some clips? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna we? say. Why don't we? Why don't we? We we have a we have a few clips here. <laughs> so you pointed out, Jason, too, that this backdrop is he's not actually in a room that looks like that. That's just a picture he picked, but it's a very strange picture. Yeah, saying. I was noticing if you watch his. Th- this is a recording of a recording, so it might not be as clear. Um, but yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. actually he's not actually in this place. But the, he he, but it's a very creepy it's kind music. of clinical. It looks like a like a. Like it looks like they're doing scary experiments in there. <laughs> um, well, he's the one with the Berggruen Institute. 
Oh, and b- before we do that, can we pull up the clip that shows his bio? Can we show up the one from Bergruen? Um, it, it's not, is it on the playlist? He, I'm just playing uh, stuff off of the playlist because no, I didn't I, have did time you, to. Did you have a, I, 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 I think I sent you a link. Can we just open it real quick? Like sure. from the email? <laughs> um, because I think his bio is actually important to know what they're studying. Oh, I think, I know I already have it up here. Hold on. Yeah, yeah that's what bio. I was saying. I is think it this one? Yeah. So, okay. So, oh, what a nice hair, Benjamin. Okay. So here he's at the Ber- Ruin Institute. Um, oh, it was the uh, the one next to the sunflower, the Anathera. Uh, it starts with it's e, oh, no, uh, it's no. got a B the, next to it. Uh, nope, nope. These are all the links. Yeah, that, that one. Anti. Nope, that, that was that one. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, Anti Kythera. Okay, so this is where again, Bergruen himself was an interested in early modern European magic. And so the, the program that Bratton is involved with is, I don't know, do you say it? Antikythera, A-N-T-I-K-Y-T-H-E-R-A. And if you scroll up a little bit more, it's named after a mechanism uh, from 200 BC and discovered in 1901 uh, in a shipwreck off a Greek island. The first primordial computer was not simply a calculator, it was an astronomical machine mapping and predicting the movements of stars and planets, uh, making a- marking annual events and organizing a naval culture upon the globe's surface. It calculated not only interlocking variables, it oriented intelligence. Okay, so this is in- the superintelligence. The future of computation mm-hmm. is tied to this relation between thinking, navigation, and the planetary. And then if you just scroll a little bit more, there are themes of research at this program are uh, synthetic intelligence, so uh, machine intelligence and natural language processing. So that's, again, some of these grammar fields. Hemispherical stacks, the geopolitics of planetary computation on platform infrastructure. So that's the protocol layer, right? That's Juan Benet. That's, I, I think that's what they're talking about is uh, biogeochemistry influencing geopolitics. Uh, recursive simulations. Uh, the emergence and development of worlds in response to simulations across domains from scientific to VR, AR in the way these models create worlds. So again, simulation, recursive though. Hmm. Uh, synthetic catal- catalaxy, uh, the potential organization of computational economics, pricing, and planning. So Lynn, that's where we've got the free market libertarians, right, is this catalaxy. The organization of computational economics and then planetary science evolutionary emergence of natural and artificial intelligence planetary sapience oh sorry sapience sorry planetary sapience yeah so this is like the world based and and it's it says that their first studio launched this winter 20 february 2023 in la but it ha- was having studios including seoul south korea and we know south, south korea is so far advanced with samsung and also mexico city and i feel like mexico city mm-hmm. is a pretty significant um very significant from a timescape standpoint. Um, so yeah, and then they've got their application portal. Um, so this is all very, I mean, interesting to me at the, the level at which that they're talking about these things. Again, it goes back to ancient Greece and that's the the demos and the Athenian city state as a super organism. And it goes into like astrology. And, you know, he has a book called The Stack, Software and Sovereignty. Again, all of the freedom people, sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty. It's because they want you to adopt this way of thinking. Jason, if you go back real quick to the, um, yeah, the, oh yeah, the hemispherical stacks, the geopolitics of planetary computation with a particular focus on platforms that really reminds me of like, so the, the BIS recently launched what they what's called like Climate Warehouse, which is like a blockchain platform for carbon credits. And also I think the IMF launched a very similar thing at the same time. But um, I mean, I feel like that's a like exact example of that. Yeah. So I'll just say one more com- quick- planetary comp- It's like climate computation, like the economics of climate computation via the carbon credits and like that platform as a, you know, enabling constraint for geopolitics. I'll just say one more thing too about the this whole CBDC conversation. Uh, I was just listening to a talk with the Government Blockchain Association, and one of the guys says, "Oh, CBDCs are a long way out." I actually agree with him. I, I don't think 
if ever, like the the the, the money that people are going to be using on a day to day basis are not going to be CBDCs. Yeah. The role of CBDCs are going to be for these wholesale, um, mm-hmm. like. Uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of it where you go in and you, you, you just like the B the BIS already does it now. It's been doing it forever. Mm-hmm. They, they, they uh, level the accounts between the, the central banks. Transaction. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, like like a clearing house. It's, it's like a clearing house, but what they're going to be doing mm-hmm. and, and initially CBDCs are just going to be for like between like the, the, the central banks, mm-hmm. just like the BIS totally. already does. It's just going to be more programmable. It's going to have more aspects to it. But the, the, the money that people use on a day to day basis, I don't think or I don't think they're ever going to be CBDCs, but see those, you know, down the chain. Yeah, the, the CBDCs play a role in this whole ecosystem, but um, and and I'm I'm actually still trying to understand how that's going to work. But if you look, at, if you spend some time like watching the the BIS talks, and and I still need to go more into the Fed now thing, which the the Federal Reserve, you know, how they're going to play into it. But they they lay it out like they tell you like this yeah. is what we're thinking, how we're going to structure this thing, and it's not the way people have been saying like oh they're going to exchange our dollars for CBDCs. More likely, we're going to be using these these private tokens that will then be connected to the CBC CBDCs down to d- down the road, but not it, it won't be direct. It'll be a, it'll be a chain. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah well, and we they went, have, yeah, and also money. with the the skills, <laughs> skills base, but with the kids yeah. and the um, so it's more our our uh, transactions, our outcomes, our outputs, um, our tokenized skills that will be more of the bartering and the transactions too. Right, and then there's another aspect which I want to do a whole video about about the tokenized assets because. Money, you know, at one point, money was supposedly backed by gold and silver. Um, so, and then a lot of people are like, we need the money to be backed by something. And so the stable coins actually make the money backed by real world assets once again through the through the tokenization of assets. And so I think what's going to happen here is uh, all, all assets in the world, including fictional assets of like behavior, <laughs> whatever, are, are going to are the, the tokens that we're going to be using are ultimately going to be backed by by real world assets once again through through tokenize mm-hmm. through tokenization. But I still haven't quite figured out exactly how that's going to work. But um, I think if people can get to the point of understanding these exchanges as signals, as coordinating mechanisms of different sites and different flavors and different kinds. What they're, what these types of people, and I'm not saying that that it's exclusively this, but if from the headspace of the complexity theorists and people who are looking at complex systems analysis and biohybrid socio-technical computing, they want to tap the quote unquote wisdom of crowds. They, they There is something that the machine can't do that is needed in uh, human intelligence and not just isolated human intelligence, but on uh, carefully curated groups of people who ha- bring different kinds of philosophy of mind into things to solve their wicked problems, right? They actually want that. And then the coordinating mechanisms of programmable money or tokens or signals, that is, I think, what makes uh, those, it, it's the language of the machine is how those those signals are exchanged and how they come together and, and are organized. That's what makes the machine readable. And so, um, you know, with Leotaire wanting the ecology of currency, they want programmable money, but not just money, all kinds of things. And it is a, it is a, a signal like a signal that it happens at a cellular basis in your body to tell the cell what to do, what to become, how to act. That, that So there's a control, but then there's also a certain amount of creativity that they want built in because you're, you're not, that is what we have that the machine doesn't have, right? Like we have love, like, you know, wrinkle in time, and we have creativity and imagination. And so they want to domesticate that into a structure wherein whatever this computational system that is emerging can harvest it towards its own purpose, so... Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's go through some of these clips. So this is um, Benjamin. This is Ben telling us we have to not be human anymore, or the world's <laughs> going to end. What I mean is that humans should understand the actual agency that they have. My the call is not for the elimination of human sentience or sapience, or a degradation of the rich cultural dramas 
but to conceive, rather to conceive the world and to compose it, to compose it according to a model that locates uh, human consumption and production cycles with the care and specificity of a more dispassionate position. Human experience of human experience of the world or just of itself was thought to present a, a deeper truth than a materialism for which we are one, but all, one, albeit lovely, uh, form of sentient matter, but not the only one. So the, the need to remake the model of the human, the idea of the human, that normative form, um, is in this sense a kind of ethical call, um, but it's one that would, would, is, is not against the revelations of technology, it, it's real target it is, 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 is humanism. That the post-anthropocene is simply, this is the era in which humans are no longer the dominant geological actor. Um, it may be because we were uh, replaced, we made ourselves extinct. Uh, it may be that we were replaced by something else, or it may be that we evolve into something that we would not recognize as human. M my argument, which should be clear, is that the dangers of the Anthropocene uh, has less to do with technology run amok than it has to do with the, this humanist legacy that argues that the world is there for our needs and created in our image. Uh, we still see this in, 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 we still see this everywhere uh, and, and particularly in computing culture and I find this rather I find this rather alarming. Our status as a dominant geological actor is fleeting and that in order for us to survive, we will have to become something else than what we recognize as human. Who are we? We are the brain-eating apes with weaponized hydrogen atoms. Among the last, the last projects that we should champion is a is to support is rehumanization. The design that, that we need may may provide for some uncannily practical paths out of the anthropocene, but it is absolutely not one in which the vast and impersonal and temporal and spatial scales of global systems are brought to heel, are drawn down into our, our intuitive, neurological, and emotional comfort zones. The means by which we get outside ourselves and to see how the world works may also be the very means by which we undermine the world itself. The reason we know climate change is happening at the nuanced degree that we do know it's happening is because of the measurement capacities of the terrestrial and oceanic and atmospheric sensing meta apparatuses that are at least representative of the, an industrial technological system whose appetite is responsible for the changes that it is in fact measuring in the first place. We know what's happening because the machine tells us so. Um, yeah, what's interesting about that, too, is just like he talks about this idea that, you know, the world is here for us to just take and consume. And, and like, I agree with that that's a problematic worldview. I would argue that he's actually engaged in that worldview by by participating in these programs. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. Well, he says the words he used were, you know, the that we are, it was almost like he was saying, because man has thought about the world just being here for us, and that um, we see it being created, what did he say, created in our image, but that, those words are important, and for anybody, anyone out there who's a, a, a believer in the Bible, and God, and the, how intelligent design was created. And I don't want to get into that whole debate, but if you do believe that, which I do, then you look at Genesis, it, that's in Genesis and Genesis, the, the word itself, Genesis origin, beginning gene is in there. G E N E um, Genesis 127. God created the world or created the human beings in his image. That's not a literal trend um, uh, scripture, but it's like, so God created mankind in his own image and the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. But, but this guy is saying that we think that it was created in our image for us, but he's not talking from a, a religious or a, a 
scriptural perspective. He's just saying from a humanist perspective, very interesting words. Him playing God is what he's doing, what he's talking about. Yeah, well, they, they, he, yeah. He, he believes in intelligent design, that that, that we should be the designers. <laughs> we're, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we're so intelligent. Um, and yeah. Well, uh, I'm sure that they would, they, oh, they frame this the as, as being like, oh, we, you know, we need to protect the environment. You know, look at all the harm we're doing, and we need to create a system that takes all these things into account, as if that's actually what it, it, the, 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 per, the, the sole purpose of this is, which it's not. Was one project in his bio, was that the one, capital one, O-N-E, um, project? So. Was that in his bio? Yeah. I think so so that, that one, I think one is, uh, I thought I saw that in there, but it's blocked by my screen. Uh, but that's important when we're talking about, I saw it somewhere. I thought it was his one project. But the, those who are talking about the, the one world government one one is a you know even oh, catholic yes. means you know, oh there it is one project foundation let's see and oh that was within the antikythera uh at the bottom okay uh okay, the see, Grew an institute yeah, in los world. angeles and developed in yeah. partnership with the one project Fund. yeah um there there are those camps that recognize that there's some agenda with this whole one like everybody's supposed to be on this one uh, we're all moving this one direction, one government, one currency, one all of that. I, I don't think it um, it is one global government. It's this it's this organism. This uh, Allison has pointed out. It's it's not a one world government. But that's what certain camps would say. They recognize there is something happening. They recognize that there is something artificial or manufactured. And that we're being nudged in that way, but they don't understand the, that whole tokenized piece of this that Allison says. And uh, um, what is that word he keeps using? Anthropocene. Anthropocene. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anthropocene. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Anthrop oh, I mean, Anthropocene. Okay. Yeah. I mean, oh. see, the thing is, too, I think the tone, if you listen to the entire talk, and it was a presentation given to Kyoto, which is, you know, again, Japan is the moonshot project stuff, is... It's, it's definitely to instill sort of a sense of self-loathing in humanity, right? And, it, and it's difficult yeah, because right. on the one hand, um, there are huge issues and I, none of us deny that there are huge issues with the, around the way we care for the world and things, but it's very carefully crafted that the story, so the story isn't, you know, the, the, along the lines of what Robin Wall Kimmer or, or sort of indigenous ways of being, you know, animus, being good relatives, like having things in balance. It is more of a degrading of the role and the human, you know, he says, we shouldn't limit sort of this vast expanse into human intuition, right? We shouldn't, that's the wrong way to go. Later on, he'll say like going back to nature is the wrong way to go. We need to lean into the vastness of computation and then like let go of the intuitiveness of the human being. And I think that that's done by design. And the thing that I, I, realize in retrospect is I feel like that it's instilled a sense of self-hate in a lot of the, the young mm -hmm. generation name of caring for the environment. Like that if you care for the environment, you you have to carry this burden of self-hate, even though Jason, like as we know, Jason, many of the systems is we're in a game we didn't create run by powerful structures that we're, we, we have little management control yeah, over yeah, right they want to put like the onus like, on oh, the individual the planet by all having paper straws like no that but we're not going to address the defense department budget like none right. of those things make sense but i think that <laughs> not, not, not only are we not going to address the the defense department we're going to work with them on the solution <laughs> right exactly so not, I, that's corporations or you name them you know and that we need to yeah. become something other than human which is the biohybrid intelligence i think like we have to give up weirdly holding our sovereignty but we have to be sovereign beings in collective platform systems to become and those collective platform systems include non-human entities whether those be you know giraffes with wallets or you know algorithms with wallets or whatever like we have to enter into convergence with these other things at a, at a very high level of our like soul and consciousness which Again, I, we're not in a position of making an informed decision about that yet at all. Hey, Len, isn't there a boy he band also opened with called uh, One Direction? Yeah, One Direction. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes. But yeah, Allison, I got the, the, the same thing. 
Yeah. That yeah about the the like honestly I felt like a Insane. lot of what you were saying was <laughs> fairly incoherent, but like even like within his own logic, but that um yeah basically self like that we're bad that humans are bad and that and I don't know if we got the brains eating part. It's like we're brain like why why we yeah. eat brains? <laughs> it's like that didn't really make sense, but um. Mm. Yeah, and then also I, I totally agree with like the younger generation. I feel like that's a huge thing. Is that like if you're someone who like identifies as environmentalist or like fighting for the environment, that you have to hate yourself pretty much. It's like a hundred percent requisite and call out. Like you know, I mean, of course there are, like I do believe like privilege and I, like you know I think there's a lot of reality to. Uh, like recognizing privilege when there's been, you know, mass enslavement and all these other things that have been going on right. forever. But um, yeah, but using like, it as a uh, weapon to right. hate yourself and and then to put us in divided camps because of our race or ethnicity or because of our uh, what, our contribution to environmental issues. It's the self loathing. I I also see it in the self loathing for your gender, the, the gender self-loathing. Like, I don't want to be this sex. I want to be that sex. And so I hate these parts of my sex and I want to change them to that sex. And it's the, um, it's the confusion created. And then the, um, it, by, with the self-loathing, then you're looking for the solution to get out of it. And they present a counterfeit solution that yeah. is, steering I, it really is steering wow. people yeah and 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 again the intuition like he's saying like no 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 we're not bringing this back down to nature and into intuitiveness and and create no 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 we're giving it to the protocol layer right and and you know and, and that comes along later with kevin and Waki, right we're we're going to do this cooperatively for our common good and for the good of all beings on the planet to participate through this dynamic routing mechanism right that is that that will provide whatever the you know address uh, all of the flaws of humans through hal 9000 or <laughs> what what have you then we then we you know well the picture on this next one's kind of funny because it's like they're like well i guess we could watch the video where he explains it but like just like the creating the artificial you know he's like you know artificial is not a bad thing <laughs> it's, it's basically right. just but but like, even like this, like, I'd be curious, what was, what's the point of this? <laughs> uh, planting Probably more machine readable. I don't know. Tr Maybe tr not. Plant Maybe planting the trees. Are... I mean, it's pretty, you know, yeah. it's like people have, you know, gardens where they, <laughs> where they. Yeah, you can plant lanes. trees in a circle. It just looks like the alien invasion where it lands in a field. And does a... <laughs> oh, yeah. Crop circles. <laughs> yeah. Circles. I don't know if those are, I have go. no idea what the word well, is. I think this one has a good quote about like going back to nature isn't the answer. So maybe we'll just run this one and yeah, see. Of course, we get the little bar, the climate change. So they're going to educate us about what we should think about this clip, you know, <laughs> in advance, which is, you know. One of the key ideas that we work with is around uh, an, uh, 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 an, an embrace of the notion of the artificial. Um, now, the notion of the artificial as we propose it is not as is the connotation in English can also mean uh, fake or inauthentic or counterfeit. And but it can also mean, uh, and this is more the way we mean it, uh, something that is deliberately composed, that was made on purpose. Uh, that was was structured. And so this image, which is also from Japan, and you're probably familiar with it, uh, it's quite clear that, that there was an artificial intervention uh, here in the forest uh, that in such that would make these trees, not a photoshopped image, make these trees grow in this radial pattern. We can detect the artificiality of this. Our conviction is that the response, the successful response to anthropogenic climate change, man-made climate change, will need to be equally man-made, equally anthropogenic, and that the many of the, uh, all cultures have some distinction between you know, nature and culture. And in the West, 
those distinctions, uh, I think, are in, in particular, are pr proving uh, uh, quite unhelpful uh, in, in, in understanding exactly how it is that we must artificially produce um, the, the, world that come, the world that comes next. In the West, as you probably are aware, environmentalism and ecological issues are often discussed in relationship to a return to nature. Uh, and we see this as, as probably the, uh, the wrong path. <laughs> it's kind of wild because it's it's so opposite of how I view the world. <laughs> right. You know? And it's right. like and the it's arrogance. So arrogant. It's yeah, the arrogance of the arrogance. these people. Like we you know, it's it's kind of incredible. Leo, what were your thoughts? Oh. Um oh, you're muted. I mean, uh oh. muted, sorry. Sorry, the phone oh, rang. Yeah. No, I just wanted on the forest thing, I just wanted to say Jason, can we go back so that we can see the forest on, on one of the key ideas? Yeah. We can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> right. But <laughs> the the communication signaling of the forest, right? Like that's something that these complexity mm -hmm. scientists know all about. Like we know arise, like we know about that them understanding the mycorrhizae and the root systems and the mineral uptake and trees nursing one another, right? Oh, that tree isn't doing well, or how mm -hmm. they communicate their biochemical signaling, like through all of that. And so to actually use that as their feature is like an abomination. It would seem to go against all of what they actually, many of the scientists are studying in terms of bio-inspired natural design, like the level of sophisticated interplay in a healthy um, forest ecosystem to, to, to go in, like that's an abomination in that context, because what does that signaling communication look like? I mean, it, it's 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 a mere shadow of of the dynamic agile response that you would find in a natural forest ecosystem that that is able to adequately respond to threats, you know, pests or you know, disease or what have you. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. And also, just going back to Neil Postman in, in terms of what's gained and what's lost, you know. So what's destroyed? Yeah. What's destroyed in these processes? You know. In the creation of all this technology and all this artificial, you know, what what is lost in that? Like that needs to be at least considered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he well, it, I it seems like those, intentionally you know, the, the loss. Or yeah, I mean, if, from what he's saying, intentionally the losses, you know, mm -hmm. in, intuition and, um, you know, essentially faith in our ability to, like be in relationship yeah. with anything in ourselves and each other. And, um, well, that's dangerous, so. Leo, and we fail. <laughs> and so we just need to move on. <laughs> yeah. It's well, actually, dangerous. I'm looking at the word, the word spells, because Allison and I talk about this a lot and thinking about the, just the term climate change and, and it's, um, in climate, we, they do these climate surveys in the schools or climate surveys in the corporations. How do you, you know? How do you feel about the the temperature of the the business or the the school? And um, how do you feel about it? Kids or teachers are doing these surveys. But thinking about also with climate change, they're literally changing the climate, and then uh, you know with the weather futures. And then saying, oh, we're doing all of these things, but the remedy. And he even. It admits it's the the language that they're using sounds like it's fake or inauthentic or counterfeit, but no, 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 that's that's not true. But we need the artificial and the artificial intelligence. It's another interesting um, term that they use because it's it's again it's it's fake intelligence, but they're trying to to. Um, pitch that as the remedy and we all organically know if we're doing this and it's not natural all these plastics and things are there then you would want to return to nature and weren't our grandmothers kind of uh and great grandmothers i mean they were kind of green you know the way that they recycled wow. things and used the compost and they would take quilt pieces from you know remnants of this and that patch put it together and make something beautiful as allison the quilter that she is knows um but that, that's not what they're everything they do is synthetic it's a it's a an I didn't include it, but he he does have a clip where he literally says that the because the planetary scale computation says that we have to terraform the earth 
in order for humans to survive, we yeah. must terraform the earth. And I mean, to me, I, I mean, where does that fit in? Like within the whole geoengineering climate change narrative, if what the, these people at these high levels are saying, okay, so the plan is in order to save life on planet earth, that we will terraform it. And I mean, it's, that's just not part that's of the change terra i mean land terraform means to uh, manipulate or to change what yeah so and normally it's they they would speak about terraforming like interplanetary civilizations right you go to a planet that isn't conducive to life oh. and then you use mm -hmm. chemical or other manipulations oh. to i you know tectonic weapons or things to like create an oxygenated atmosphere and to create land mass or whatever and, and that's part of that Adrian Tchaikovsky's, a lot of their, they were using nanotech and different things to terraform plant, other planets. But what he's saying is that we need to actually t remake, re-terraform Earth. Again, that, that's an imperative because we're bad, 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 and we have weaponized hydrogen atoms and eat brains. And therefore, the answer is to not be human anymore, to be something other than human and to terraform the planet into a different thing. And, and, and again, like we all know that we, these conversations have not been had publicly. Yeah, when the terraforming has been uh, around in uh, science fiction for quite a while, but usually it was like, oh, Mars, are you this uninhabitable mm -hmm. planet that they were going to plant this thing and then turn the, you know, make the planet grow again? Um, but I, it, yeah, this is the first time I've heard about like, I mean, obviously that's what we're doing. We've been terraforming the, terraforming the planet <laughs> for a yeah. long time, but I, I just had never actually heard somebody say it like that mm -hmm. so, about Earth. Yeah, and like we're destroying the nat the natural systems okay. in order to build it back up. It's like turning yeah. the planet into Mars in order to yeah. like bring our own composed like artificial mm -hmm. intelligence into. Yeah, even yeah, like mountaintop building. removal. You know, like they they level the mountain, yeah. take the stuff out of it, and then like they'll build this fake ass mountain in its place that's right. just you know <laughs> like <laughs> it rodes away, and it's it's not you know. It, it, you know, they like, oh, look, look how great it looks. It's like, no, actually, it's not the same thing anymore. And there's no, all the diversity of life is gone. And yeah, it's kind of crazy. Okay, next one. Okay. Really, HFE as the science. Oh, can, I, can I say something well. when we start this? Sure. Okay, so Steffers, really I think. HFE as the oh, science. Sorry, no. <laughs> I right. went back to the beginning. It automatically starts. So. Yeah. But, sorry. Yeah, so I was going to say, I think Steffers put this guy on my um, radar, and HFE is Human Factors Engineering. So again, that's something along with like right. socio-technical or cyber-physical. I think that that is a useful concept to know that they're playing around with. These are risk consultants, Leo. So these are people who are informing risk, probably at like, you know, a homeland security standpoint, but also insurance risk different aspects. And so what stood out for me is the way they were doing whole planet modeling with this work model scenario. And they had little boxes with all these different possibilities. And then they were webbed together with different lines and diagrams, um, a la, you know, a sentient world simulation kind of model. And to me, when I saw this, and this is why I put it in, is that all of those boxes and sort of the, the frameworks that they were using in this work domain analysis survey looked a lot like a storyboard. And so I'm increasingly feeling like moving forward yeah. in applying game mechanics to the real world, that they're going to give people stories and train the children through ed tech to believe that they're, you know, there's really no, not much difference between um, playing around in a story for school and living a story, right, a, that's given to you. And that these storyboards will be weighted algorithmically to, towards certain outcomes. And, and later on, I have a a short thing about an interactive comic book that had a heat map of like a choose your own adventure, literally a choose your own adventure type of thing. That was a, a combination of your human choice and decision theory combined with algorithmic weighting. And so again, all of this tied to risk landscapes is, is the reason that I, I pulled this piece in. Hmm. HFE as the science that deals with human health and well-being has a key role to play in responding to these challenges. Uh, and really, there's two kind of aspects to that. Um, the first really is that a key feature of most of these massive global risks is they're often highly complex, of course, but they're human centered. So they're brought about by human behavior in the first place. And also effective management of them really does require widespread changes in human organizational societal behaviors. 
we do have a set of theory and methods that really are capable of helping to understand some of these issues. And, and you know, I'm talking particularly here about systems HFE. And so we feel strongly, uh, and also Andrew does as well, that systems HFE is really suited to analysing and responding to these global risks. Why do we say that? Um, largely because these methods are designed to actually describe overall complex problems and complex systems. And I guess the key point is that they look at the interaction between different parts of a system and what emergent behaviour arises from that. And I think that has an important role to play in kind of responding to some of these issues. Um, and so most of you will know work domain analysis. For those of you who don't, it's basically a systems analysis method uh, from the cognitive work analysis framework. What you're doing really you're producing an abstraction hierarchy which describes the purposes of the system, the values within the system, basically the things that need to be done to achieve the purposes and then all of the objects that are used for this. Um, and you also, through means, ends, links, then look at how all of these things relate to one another. And it's actor independent, so you're just really modeling, mod modeling the system uh, rather than the people within it. And so we basically think that this is one of those useful methods that can really design these, uh, describe and help understand these highly complex global risks. Uh, and so the first kind of test we did of this was um, we, we really wanted to test the idea that systems HFE methods can deal with large scale, highly complex modeling problems, such as these global risks. Uh, and we basically set about developing a work domain analysis of the world. Uh, and you know what we wanted to do here is really test the assertion that WDA could cope with problems at a global scale. And you can see we were able to develop um, you know, quite a, a usable um, and actually decipherable model of the world. Um, and there was some interesting things that we then did with that. We started to then look within the model to see whether there were leverage points, whether there were any leverage points or places in a system where you can intervene to have you know, large and dramatic effects. What we're kind of coming to is, we've talked a bit about method selection tonight, really when you're faced with these you know, large scale complex problems, we actually think a many model approach is the best way to do. So instead of trying to work out, well, you know, should I use stamp or should I use the hammer as we've heard it called tonight, work to analysis or causal loop diagrams, actually our work looking at road trauma kind of suggests that you should use all of them. Uh, and uh, Scott Page is a complexity scientist who kind of talks about, you know, when you've got these large scale, hugely complex problems, you don't need to pick a method, you throw the lot at it. And we've actually tried that with systems HFE and it works very well. Wow, there's so much I want to say. But Alison, <laughs> right. you go ahead because I'm sure you really analyze this. Yeah. Well, I just, I hope you, saw, like in that work domain analysis, how we kind of had a little section that was blown out with like little boxes. And before, like we did some work around that conductor, sort of like crisis management, uh, crisis actor kind of platforms. Uh, I think Leo, you and Jason and I talked about that at one point a little bit in the protocol stuff, the idea of uh, these conductors of slotting in with social media, like simulations of crises, um, but it could be also like the real world. And again, thinking about the idea of the octopus where you have a crown brain, the, the central brain that sets the goal. And then you have the brains in all of the tentacles, the eight subbrains, and that they explore local conditions and then come up with solutions to the problems. I feel like that's what the protocol layer is, is this idea of having a top system and they will frame it as well-being metrics, right? This is what we're hearing all like happiness metrics, well-being metrics, uh, you know, socio-technical metrics. And then it will be up to the different units underneath to figure out the solution to the overarching goal. And I, I can see that being applied to some of these futarchy principles or the quadratic voting and uh, Internet of Things sensors and the wisdom of crowds and these little subunits. Um, you know, Juan Benet was talking about like thousands of flowers bloom, like let many different ideas thrive that like you'll have a lots of different possible solutions to the problem, right? And then in, in the sort of free marketplace of ideas, they'll decide which ones that would come up. But, okay. you know, I, I didn't include it because it was a kind of a long clip longer than I wanted to share, but it was this uh, research fellow from uh, South Korea who had been working with a former uh, research director at Disney Innovation in Pittsburgh. I didn't realize Disney was also had outfits in Pittsburgh. The, the co-author was a... Uh, adjunct at Carnegie Mellon, and they were looking at creating individual storylines based on a real-time photo data flows in Disney theme parks. Mm -hmm. 
And so what they would use would be use the digital dust, like the metadata tagging and also artificial vision and extrapolation to put together someone's photo feed either individually and then running collective comparisons to create story arcs of their theme park experience. And then again, at an individual level and then at a collective level. And they said that theme parks were really useful because again, it's all constructed. It has a, you can't experience the whole thing. So there are, there's a forced choice architecture. And, you know, he gave an example, like if you have a family with mostly boy kids, you're going to hit the superheroes ones first. If you have a family with mostly girl kids, you're going to hit the princess things first. And so they could start to like shape the experience and then predict the next behavior. Now they were framing all of this as using photo streams as like to create, I don't know, maybe a recommendation engine for an in-park app use. But like we know that Disney is far more integrated into, you know, uh, digital media, immersive reality, consciousness management, defense overlapping, but the the LDS church, Um, like Disney's, you know, a a cutting edge place of, you know, exploring these technologies in in a a controlled setting and, you know, beloved part of the American ideal. And to me, I thought, wow, if you combine the comic book, the interactive comic book with this uh, predictive modeling for certain outcomes and this idea of like in a very specific way, how you use our digital dust to shape, to understand our psychology and our desires, and then f- move that mm-hmm. forward across time into to certain predictions. Um, it just felt like this, this in, and later we're going to be, lo- hopefully we'll have time to look at the energetic landscapes. Like they're using the modeling mechanisms to shape the energetic landscapes to get us to participate in the game in a way that I, I think the system hopes to optimize for productivity, right? And then, and clearly underlying all of this risk is the insurance stuff, which Leo, I mean, that's your your bailiwick too. I was going to mention too, for those who don't know, Disney is not just Disney, the channel on TV and Disney, the theme park. They are a massive media conglomerate who owns a lot of things that you wouldn't even suspect that Disney owns. I was trying to find a list of some of their properties, but they're they are one of like one of the top five media conglomerates in the in the whole world. I mean, they own they own a lot of stuff that's that's beyond just the amusement park and all of that. So I was trying to find a you know I'll try to find a list or something. Um, anyways, I just thought I would point that out that we're not just talking about an amusement park and a and a kids TV channel. Uh, they own news no. news stations and all kinds of stuff. So. And very involved in education. Jason, remember that video that you sent to us? It was about the fast pass. And I that was a real eye opener for me in understanding. Uh, I think, Leo, you were talking about the guardrails they set up, or maybe it was Jason talking about the guardrails they set up. But um, then you're, you're uh, in this theme park, and over the decades, they've studied traffic patterns and human behavior and incentives and dangling this carrot and giving them this option and uh, and so it's been decades of studying that and that fast pass video was excellent and I, I had never thought about that piece of it um and then this mini model thinking map you've got allison here of, of there of the paul salmon or salmon um th- thinking of the topography and all these layers that they have mm-hmm. and, and he's saying just you know don't just don't just do this model or this model you can do all these overlaid and um, it reminded me of that hexagonal, you know, they were talking about with Uber and the geospatial tiling is you could overlay something like that onto this too. And looking at uh, us all as like little nodes that they can track and, and um, study our behavior in that way, which Disney kind of does on a smaller scale. Uh, and then um, also I want to go back to the, the global challenges. They're all, that seems to be part of that storyboard that that you've clued into Allison that they everything has there's something about that emotional connection and a story and and, um and the uh, they they always start with the well solving the world's most pressing challenges I've seen this phrase over and over again solving the world's uh most pressing issues or these global challenges and how we're all supposed to be coming up with ways to solve these global problems um in the schools, they talk about problem-based learning or project-based learning, and I clued into that as you did, Allison. There were, it, education was shifting, and when they're talking about remaking or reinventing well, all these other systems, education is one of those. And they've done it by shifting away from the what they call sit and get, where you would learn 
you know, move through a textbook. You, you now are, the kids are tasked with solving adult issues through project-based learning because it's supposed to develop critical thinking. Um, there is something in that design thinking and changing the spaces of the schools, making it more of this group effort uh, instead of your individual effort. Um, that is a, an agenda that ties in with this. Uh, and the last thing was um, the, what else did I write up? I don't know, that, that was pretty much it. But I, I think that those are, are interesting pieces of this with the this high yeah. mind or collective brain. Yeah, I feel like the obvious thing, which you pointed out, Allison, for a long time is the social development goals being mm -hmm. the, um, you know, like hierarchical steering outcome goal for yeah. these different systems that you'd be using different models to implement. And then, you know taking bets out on the likelihood of failure and sort of, yeah, the whole insurance <clears throat> aspect comes in, but yeah. And you yeah, can see tough, within isn't... these models, like both education, um, health records, right? The Newton, right? Education is the most data mineable place until we get nanobots, right? In our bodies. And then it'll be the health stuff. And then maybe the nanobots in the soil, it'll be the ecosystem, right? The real time. But all of that is about like refining the model making. Cause I'm sure at this point, they're still pretty basic, like rudimentary, but that they hope to get them to be very granular. Right. Oh, I thought of one last thing, Jason, on the Disney deal is that Disney also, this is so strange, but I have a book from Dallas Education back in the 50s, and Disney actually provided the sex ed in the 50s in Dallas ISD wow. with videos. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was fascinating. Who knew? <laughs> Mickey. We're after the reproduction. <laughs> Mickey and Don Oliver. <laughs> like <laughs> modeling oh <laughs> sex ed for Dallas ISD kids. Oh yeah. No I, wonder we're I all to, a mess. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> That's crazy. I have to run actually now. But. All right. Well, thank you, Leo, for hanging okay, out. Okay. Yeah. Great Thanks, to talk. Leo. Nice to meet you. Always Zin. appreciate Thanks. your your thoughtful perspective. Thanks. You too. Bye, Jason. Bye. Bye. All right. Okay, we're here to talk about coordination protocols. And if you don't know what the f I'm talking about, you get to look at Octavian's graphics during the talk. So it's worth worth paying attention either way. I'm Kevin Waki. I have a uh, computer science degree from University of Delaware in 2006. Delaware. Still uh, identify as a software engineer, but I'm really more of a meme lord these days. Um, and I'm the founder of Supermodular, which is a regen venture studio uh, that is working on building regenerative crypto economics and also a co founder of Gitcoin. Has anyone in the audience heard of Gitcoin? There we go. Freebie audience engagement. But I just tricked you into a demo of a protocol, which is the hand raised protocol uh, used to non verbally communicate binary information. And I think that that's fun because we're used to thinking about protocols like TCP IP and blockchains, but protocols are just rule sets for how different agents interact with each other. And um, internalizing protocols as something that we do every day in order to, to coordinate, I think it, it helps sort of like humanize and build up to the complex. Uh, consensus-based based mechanisms and protocols that we have and we use every every single day. I got nerd sniped by Venkatesh Rao, did a podcast with him. And basically the premise of the podcast was most of history and the way that we tell history is institution-centric or nation-state-centric or agent-centric. But what if we took a more protocol-centric view of the world? So basically, instead of talking about individual agents and their stories, individual nation states and their stories, and um, what if we looked at the protocols that they use in order to coordinate with each other, how they co-evolve, how they fork, uh, and how they co-evolve with us. Um, another allegory you could use for this line of thinking is like, I don't know if anyone's ever read The Botany of Desire, which is this famous book about how um, if you actually look at the history of like, the crops that humanity uses, like marijuana and apples, um, it from a certain age, like from their point of view, they're using the humans to reproduce themselves, which I thought was like a pretty profound um, way of thinking about the, sy the, the synergies between uh, like Red Delicious Apple is using us to so that it can reproduce. Like we are the agents that are serving the Red Delicious Apples and allowing them to proliferate 
uh, and and not the the other way around. So if you look at protocols and the way that they inhabit us and give us evolutionary advantage so that they can replicate, then I think that that was a pretty profound way of uh, looking at the world. And it's kind of, um, you know, changed the way I, I think of things. Uh, you may know about the meme, it's all coordination, but now I think that it's all coordination via protocols and it always has been. All right, it's called the handshake protocol. Are you ready? Yes, we did. It's like it's like that we all we all just knew about those protocols, like they were already in us and using us to coordinate themselves, to replicate themselves. Did I mention that it's all coordination protocols and that it always has been? Well, what I think that uh, gets gets especially interesting is thinking about the topology of each coordination oh. protocol. So thinking about it like a shape rotator would think about each protocol. So basically. How does this protocol change the incentive lands landscape of the way people coordinate around the protocol? The topology of the incentive landscape of the handshake protocol co-evolved with humanity. And, you know, that's sort of a basic example that's just sort of fun and trivial. And I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like a toy example. It's the hello world of protocols. But, you know, what happens when you scale that up to... Uh, ecosystems where you're doing quadratic funding with each other. And you can just, the agents in that system can start to realize that you're working on public goods uh, and you're going to get rewarded for that. Can that change the incentive landscape? Can that warp the incentive topology around that incentive landscape so that people can just quit their job and work on public goods would be an example of a topology. So as we build up towards the more advanced protocols in this in this chat, I want to talk about the topology of how this changes the incentive landscape around the protocol. And the scaffold of this talk is we're going to work from handshake protocol all the way up to uh, public goods funding protocols. Yeah, I like how you mm -hmm. put Ke Kevin a wacky <laughs> instead of a oh. wacky. You oh, it, it was, you Sorry. misspelled his name. It's, it was, it was, all right. That's all I right. can fix that. Yeah. That's not a big deal. Uh, yeah, so thoughts? The shape. The shape. The shape of geopolitics. Did you see the, the magenta? Hexahedron, which is the a tosahedron. The, well, I think. they first started out with the, or what? It, which is it called? Uh, I think that one's a icosahedron, and they use that for the natural national interoperability property. And I think it represents water too, actually. Icosahedron. Hmm. Yeah. Well, in the um, the Metatron's cube is similar to that, but uh, the uh, first shape was the magenta cube and and thinking that symbol recurring in 3d is the blockchain you know hexagonal badges and this tokenized economy that's often the symbol they use and um and then this one here the shape, shape rotator and it looks like those edge blocks too from uh allison from uh, iftf the institute for the future learning is earning you get your badges and your your yeah okay keep going so well, I just I put this I in because so, yeah. clearly, I mean, uh, Kevin Awaki is someone who is very prominent in the space around public goods, uh, digital commoning, you know, protocol layers. Uh, and, you know, he works closely with Michael Zargum and Griff Green. And they're all, you know, I have like I've made a map of a lot of this sort of Ethereum type of space and the coordination mechanism. And what was interesting to me, so later on we'll, we'll see more from um warero about these energy landscapes but he was making it very real in the protocol layer in the incentive structure right he kept talking about topology and topology is like changing the shape of something without uh tearing into the surface area and so one example of topology is the idea of um through like digital manipulation you could turn a donut like a torus into a coffee cup like you could sort of remake it and the surface area would still be congruent, but you could turn it into a different shape. And so within a landscape, they're saying you could change the incentive structure to accomplish different ends. And that's what the, the smart contract layer is going to be. And for me, what stood out, you know, and I don't know, maybe again, just listening to Adrian Tchaikovsky's, you know, science fiction novels and this idea of a bacterial colony seeking novelty and curiosity and new experiences tends to uh, colonize and occupy all living bodies, including the humans, to get their view of the world, but in doing so sort of, you know, essentially devastates the body and freezes them in time and makes them dysfunctional. And 
you know, when he's talking about the botany of desire and that agricultural crops, you could look at it as though they were using us to replicate themselves or that these protocols were embedded in us to replicate themselves. It, you know, and even I see like Bratton, the way he's speaking, it's sort of disjointed and uneven for someone you, you would think would just have a really, would be a much cooler operator. Um, you know, I do seem to, I, I'm starting to wonder with all the emphasis on the microbiomes and the slime molds and the bacterial colonies and the computational aspects and changing what it is to be human, like if there isn't something that's colonizing our biology to, to push us in a direction of, you know, this guided evolution, right, towards being computational. So those were the things that stood out to me. One, like the innate aspect of protocols in a coded cultural context, which um, Guaro talks about a lot, the importance of context, um, that that can either be in real life or in a digital format, and that the topological aspect of it and it tied to an incentive structure, those things are really important. And he is a key player in this space um, of, again, looking at digital public goods, that the thing that they're going to roll out next in the face of quote unquote authoritarianism, which yeah, it is, but they've already got in their back pocket the answer, which is going to be a digital commons and digital public goods that will be all incentivized by the protocol layer. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that, but yeah, Kevin, yeah. Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> you, you said it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh, did yeah, you say where this is, Jason? What's that? That was at this that that event with the Ethereum booter and the zoo, zoo. It's not the zoo blue, whatever the zoo zoo zulu or. Oh, was this uh, from that event? Yeah, yeah. This was at oh, that event. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, this, can, you, can you say what that event? So, so was? yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah. What's the name of it? I always I always get it's the at name. The very of it beginning. Wrong. If you, if you, if you go there. to the beginning Zizali. of this clip, oh, okay. You, the very it's all the way to the beginning there oh zuzalu. zuzalu zuzalu so yeah they had this uh experiment it was over a month long two I, months I was it two months okay two. Mm -hmm. yeah so it was two months and it was kind of an experiment where they brought different players from different backgrounds from synthetic biology to crypto to ai and they brought all these people together and did this kind of experiment around it was uh, like co-living so they had yeah, they, they all stayed people. together. They cooked together. They went on hikes together and they worked together. Mm -hmm. But they also were like experimenting with like like a, the the networked a networked state sort of like a digital networked state. Yeah. And then they would bring in experts to the group of established group of 200. And again, it was a two month commitment. So I'm not sure who was footing the bill for this. Uh, Vitalik Buterin and the Ethereum's, they were sort of the hosts or the instigators of this. And then they would bring in people who had expertise in the network state, digital governance, AI, uh, um, synthetic biology, and bring them in and then interface. So there, there, were, there was like out, out exterior pollination of the ideas among the core group of 200. So they sort of built a culture. And I, I think what's coming is that this is the emergent nimble experimental phase and then depending on how that all works like eventually these the, the learnings from these experiments will get plugged into the bigger players like the ibms the hewlett packards the cisco's the oracles down the road oh is this what you are you playing that clip because i this is we do have a, a flashback from yeah we do have you, a clip. okay yeah where they were the prototypes and all that okay it's in montenegro yeah, uh, th this just happened. You know, this is this is very very recent. Like that video I sent Allison, like just came out. Uh, the, well, I sent her the one with Vitalik, an interview from the Bankless. Uh, but yeah, it, like that, like just came out the other day. So I just learned about the city community. And so again, these protocol layers are going to create these um, just in time guilds. And, and this is something like in the science fiction space, Cory Doctorow that I'd read about, like a lot of his writings are based on these like non-material, non-geographically based guilds of people who have shared common interests. So these are all of the topics. Look that at that building. At. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all this, this, all this bio the beginning. That reminds me of the Tower of Babel. <laughs> it looks like the Perot Museum in Dallas. It looks like um, post-apocalyptic. I don't know. Well, the architecture. Who's the architect in um, Barcelona that does all the like the Gaudi? The, the, yeah, Gaudi. It's it's got kind of a Gaudi feel to it as well. But I think it's mm -hmm. supposed to sort of almost mm -hmm. be like resilient, right? Like the fungus will just grow your building for you or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They talk about that. 
you know? And these are but, some of the different. Yeah, AI and crypto uh, coordinations, right? And, and that's the thing Milwaukee keeps emphasizing. It's always been about coordination and it always has been. And oh, yeah, lo the longevity, that's um, th that's the people anti -aging. that are anti-aging, exactly. People that are that don't want to die. <laughs> They're, yeah, they just want to continue to live with the For extension. Forever and ever and ever. That doesn't sound good to me. <laughs> Yeah, where well, are they going to have room for everybody? We'd all just have to live in like pods because there won't be room for everybody and everybody's a robot. <laughs> well, yeah, there's so many people who talk about population, depopulation. I'm like, that's not the thing. That is not the thing. It's not the thing. Yeah, it's, it's no, domestic. They're not trying to kill us. They're trying to make us sick and dependent and extended in this yes. reality. Well, I just think, you, have you seen The, the Shining, the, to, to two little girls? And they're like, come and play with us. Forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, the twinning. The twinning, yeah. the digital twins. Um, the twinning and the shining. Okay. So this next one, we're back to Benjamin. This is just a short one, but he's talking about geotechnology. Again, he was looking at planetary sapience and like planetary scale computing and linking like geotech, like the, the, the the technology of geology to geopolitics. And this is sort of like the platform governance model. So that comes up next. The relationship, and I've hinted at this already, that the relationship between uh, technology and politics is one that's very intertwined. Um, we assume that uh, in many cases, the, 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 the future of a geopolitics and the future of a geotechnology uh, may be quite convergent. Um, and that not only is it what kind of geopolitics do we need to produce the geotechnology that we need, we are also at least open to the idea that the geotechnology may produce the geopolitics and the history of technology uh, may, be, may bear this out to a greater extent. So this is just a very short poll of a, a couple of poll quotes from this uh, presentation on Dia, which Jason, can you speak just briefly to your, the presentation you did on Ukraine, the digital transformation of Ukraine? Yeah. So I was, um, I've, I've always felt like there's a, there's a lot more to the Ukraine story than, than we understand. And, and I know that a lot of it has to do with digital governance and the, the transformation, digital transformation. So, uh, you know, the, even before, like they had that, a big event in Washington DC around introducing Dia, but even before that, uh, they had presentations about DIA at the World Economic Forum in Davos and some other things that I'd, I'd see come up on my feed that I'd watched some different some different clips. Um, so I um, I did a presentation just about like the, the connecting the war to all the digitiz digitization projects. And one of the major ones is DIA, um, which is an app. It's basically they call it, you know, your government in an app. And it's, it's an app on your phone that does a whole bunch of different things from distributing um, uh, s services and money and, and reporting on things, reporting on troop activity to, I mean, all kinds. Of, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole gamut of, of things that, that this app does. They say it like, it's like your government in your phone, essentially. Right. And it was underwritten by the U.S. government, right? Through USAID. USAID, and yeah. Powers is the the people, woman speaking on that. She's next up. Um, but this is how the blockchain identity came through the quote unquote humanitarian aid space, which is is really central. And like the the State Department, this is the new form of you know imperialism, right? Getting everyone. But it's 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 not just global north, global south, because the goal is that everyone is going to be on the app. So um, when this story got a lot of traction from like people in the the health freedom community and the, and the, and the freedom community. Cause they're like, Oh my gosh, the DIA government app. Like, and I, one of the clips that I showed was, uh, Samantha power with, with the head of, I think it was visa or, or mastercard. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was visa. Um, but they're like, you know, when are we going to get this in the U S and she kind of like him Hodge was like, ah, I don't know. Uh, like, I don't think the DI app is coming to the, the States like qu quite, is assumed, but they're going to introduce it in other countries where they're, you know, people right. are more open, more open to it. But a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a big threat to our, to our freedom. Right. Whereas I think in the U S a lot of these, a lot of the things that are built into the DIA DIA app 
are going to be built into other things and into more right. like, you know what I mean? So th you're, we're going to still get all that stuff. It's just going to be right. it's Peter Thiel will be in charge of it, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, PayPal will offer to you or what, what Venmo or what have you. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah. And, and just uh, Samantha Powers is married to Cass Sunstein, who was uh, essentially a theorist in nudge theory and very prominent in the Obama administration. So, um, you know, and, and this is the thing that it sort of frustrated me when when I posted it, someone initially commented and sort of was like, oh, my gosh, the communists. Now, this is the U.S. State Department. OK, like, I mean, unless we all believe somehow the U.S. is fundamentally communist, like that's a misunderstanding of what's happening. And, and that's a problem if at this stage you're subscribed to me and you don't understand that the narratives that are thrown out for you, um, whether it be, you know, capitalism, imperialism, communism, socialism, it's only part of the truth. And the actual truth is about digital governance in the protocol layer. So. So I don't know if you can see this. It's called Infotopia. How many minds produce knowledge by Cass Suns? Oh, uh, interesting. I have is I, I've never read this, but I, I bought it. It was on like a bargain. It, I think it was one of those bookstores that were going out of business. And I bought mm -hmm. like a, a whole bunch of books. And this was one of the books I bought. Uh, it says Extraordinary, Larry mm -hmm. Lessig. is. Uh, uh, anyway, so I just, I just was thinking about that. I was like, wait a minute, I have a book. It's called Infotopia, How Many Minds Produce Knowledge. So I'll, I'll have to like maybe read this that's what they want the wisdom of the crowd <laughs> when well, i have wisdom another of... i have another one by yohai benkler is it yohai benkler uh anyway yeah they're called the wealth of networks that i need to need to mm. revisit so the, i picked up these things along the way that i'm like that are actually i think relevant to what we're doing here so <laughs> but did you have those before we met each other oh yeah or... I've, ha I've had these books oh, yeah. forever in fact the yohai yeah. benkler yeah. one i bought f f uh, 15 years ago Forest, you were just getting ready. Yeah, I was, I was, I don't know how I just ended up with these books. Babatia and what's going on. Um, and it's about government that actually works. Uh, we're going to talk about how the government can help, specifically the government of Ukraine, which is using these technology initiatives. I joke about the government not working, but uh, digital government is critically important moving forward. I think it's really important to think and talk about how we participate in technology in society and with our government, with our elected leaders. And far too much time has been spent um, weaponizing all this technology um, and so here we're going to talk about how we can use it to help us to help us move forward well now ukraine is becoming famous for something else a new product the ministry of digital transformation is working to make dia an open source digital public good that it will give to other countries so that they can build digital public infrastructure that serves their citizens. Partner countries that are inspired by DIA and want to accelerate their own digital transformation by developing and expanding their own e-government capabilities. Imagine that nearly everything that you need from your government, you can get with simple taps on your phone or browser. Over this past year, DIA has been a lifeline for the Ukrainian people, providing everything from cash payments for internally displaced people to an easy way for people to report damage from Putin's missile strikes. So a platform like DIA relies on robust and secure digital public infrastructure, which we have been working with the Ukrainian government, UK aid, and the Eurasia Foundation to build since the year 2016. The state in a smartphone. And now we want to share what they've built with the world. So that pretty much says it all. But, you know, for me, it nice. really helps this idea of what works government. You know, that Michael Bloomberg and our former mayor, Michael Nutter, were pushing, you know, open data, smart cities, what were, you know, transparency, uh, you know, open source, everything like that's all part of this digital government scenario. Right. And 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 that's you know, part of the, the game mechanics is all, is all part of that. But governance, again, also being Kubernetes or cybernetics. And, and so it's, it's just getting clearer and clearer how, how the narrative is being managed. And I think one thing that confuses a lot of people too, where if they're coming at this from like, um, maybe a conservative uh, ideological standpoint, which is, 
they're like, oh, oh, oh government. Okay, D is bad because that's government. But this thing over here right. is not bad because it's not government. And you gotta, you can't look at these things as two separate things. These are th these things are going to interact. Yeah, they're complementary. And you know, digital I, I like, government. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, yeah, government itself is 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 about to radically change, and a lar a large percentage of it it is going to be privatized, but it's going to be connected to government on the back end through APIs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And those are the different protocol layers, but that's the one of the. I think that's one of the biggest obstacles that 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 keeps people from actually seeing the whole elephant, <laughs> seeing the whole thing for what it is, is that 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 you know, like that's everybody was all up in arms about the Dia thing, but those same people weren't saying a damn thing about any of the other stuff that Allison and you and I have been talking about for right. several years now. You know, so. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating. <laughs> I always think it's interesting when government uses the term ministry. You know, I know Singapore has a ministry mm. of education and she men mentioned ministry uh, and, and public good. And there's another clip, Allison, that I think you're playing where they're talking about the public good versus just the altruistic, natural, doing something nice for someone or a, an act of service. Uh, that term public good um, is also used for education, at least in Texas, I'll say it's the public good. And that's part of our, it's in our constitution to provide for the public free education. Uh, I noticed just this whole thing. They said, Oh, well, since 2016, we've been doing this and now we can scale it, you know, to the, um, to deal with this, uh, the crisis, but the, there's the manufacturer crisis. And then there's always the, the, counterfeit solution it's always more technology it's always more um it, um more that's what dia is i mean that's basically what they're wanting yeah. is to to provide all the government services through these convenient technologies and they're right they're ready to go before the crisis ever began right. just like new orleans and Along the charter with school thing right yeah. So it was like U.S. Along State Department with plus Visa. Well, Visa is the, the, you know, the, the private, yeah. right? And it's like, you can't say, well, we don't like the government, but we like the private. Well, no, Visa is doing it too. Like Visa is not the government, right? right. It's, it's an integrated program. Yeah, it's a, it is a public-private mm -hmm. partnership. It's not strictly the government. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I mean, even like USAID is providing all the funding. I mean, that's what's always done. They, you know, they, they provide the, the resources, you know, but then it's... Resources the skids yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so this one so um, this, this is a discussion um with uh vitalik buterin and this guy from bankless who was one of the 200 participants in this two-month project um and they're talking about um zero knowledge proofs and digital identity and that they tried out this new qr code app called the zoo pass or whatever i mean and again it's kind of funny word spells right zoo. the zoo zuzalu like i don't know why they came up with this goofy name but the zoo pass right you're a zoo a confined you know caged animal in a you know spectacle um and how it works and then the next step after this we're going to talk a little bit about coordinating signals in biology and membranes like semi-permeable membranes and you know, the, the, she talks about like passports and visas instead of boundaries and walls. And so that's exactly what they're talking about here is this sort of semi permeable membrane control mechanism that's based on the QR code and digital identity. But don't worry, it's not a health passport. For it's people who want to know what ZooPass is, ZooPass is kind of like, it's a passport. Um, yes. Except for Zuzalu, two month long yes. passport that works inside of this community. Right. Um, but it, it is now like infrastructure that future Zuzalus or mm -hmm. future other um, temporary communities can also mm -hmm. use. So yeah. it's a, there was like this top is this dynamic passport that mm -hmm. could change. Uh, but then also you could collect stamps. Um, right. So okay. Got, so the interesting thing about it, I think, uh, just, uh, you know, make it clear to viewers that this is not the same as a COVID vaccine card right, yeah. um, is uh, that uh, is the zero knowledge aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, like here, if I can uh, take out my uh, zoo pass right now, um, basically it's a QR code and that QR code contains a yeah, zero knowledge proof, like just a, you know, standard snark, I forget if it's Groth or Plunk or whatever, um, which proves that I am a member of the set of Zuzulu residents without revealing which one I am. 
Um, and so like a bunch of interesting apps were built on this. So there was Zoo Poll, which uh, basically had like polls where only through Zulu residents could vote, but uh, the votes were anonymous. And only vote once. Yes, and only vote once. And then ZooCast, which was a, a Twitter where all the accounts were numbered accounts and only if you were a Zulu resident, so you could only get one numbered account. Mm -hmm. As then, so you know, like a lot of uh, really fun, um, you know, online uh, stuff happens. I mean, they're used for just like physical gatekeeping for an events when capacity got limited as well. And then there's uh, stamps, which are the Zubas equivalents of popes. So like, I was a uh, cook for one of the community dinners, and I got a pope saying that I'm a cook. Um, and then. Uh, what else? Uh, You'll be getting one for being on the Bankless podcast here at Susan. Yeah, as well. Indeed, perfect. Um, yeah, there's like a, bu a bunch of, uh, you know, really uh, nice uh, po popes that uh, have been going around. And so, by the way, the pope, they're, they're not talking about the pope. <laughs> yeah, they didn't get their own pope. Uh, yeah. The Pope is proof, proof of uh, attendance or participation. Uh, so, like, if you go to an event, you would get a you would get a token saying you went to the event, or or if you participate, you did something, you get a little token that said you participated in in in, in like an event or something. And I really feel like those. Well, are they say it's totally anonymous. Right. Yeah, well, that's what's so totally stupid about the. But... Go ahead. Well, just if they they say it's anonymous, but. You can only vote once. Well, if you can only vote once, it's not anonymous because they know and they can tie that to you. And if they're dinging you with the poke, it's just it's funny when people think it's anonymous. Well, the thing is, it's it's anonymous. It depends. On, it's anonymous to whom. So it's anonymous to certain certain people. But the, the, the system, it's you're not anonymous to the, the system. system. It's not. That's what I mean. Yeah, That's exactly. What I mean. It's not. anonymous. But, and it's so stupid it's anyway. So who cares if they don't knowledge. know? The, the end result is still the same as the health passport, actually, uh, whether they know your yeah. name or not. The point of it is to say, are, are you uh, uh, can you be included or should you be excluded? I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. the end result. It still it still serves the same function, whether with or without zero knowledge proof. So zero knowledge proof is is kind of stupid. It, you know, it, 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 they're concerned about like, oh, well, you know, someone might hack your thing or whatever. So we don't want someone to know your personal private information. Um, but th my biggest concern about the passport is that they're setting up this thing that says, yes, you can you can you can enter or no you cannot enter yes you can participate or no you can't participate it's it's still creating this system of inclusion and exclusion uh, you know that's that's the end result of it so whether it's zero knowledge proof or not is not like the the, the most important thing at least to me uh, but they're they're framing that as like the big deal you know like oh don't worry it's zero knowledge proof um, you know but you're still not going to be uh, they're, they're still going to be using this to categorize you. Screen, yeah, categorize and screen. And screen, And yeah, I will exactly. just say too, um, I mean, when you listen to it, it this is about a pop-up community, right? So an intentional temporary community, that I think that's part of the computational node system, right? Is assembly and disassembly of social systems. They talk about putting it together for use by other um, other organizations that want to use this technology. So, I mean, that's another app like the DIA app, right? Like a, a social governance system. And um, it's just, it, it's a passporting system. Like it literally is a passporting to your community to situate you within the community and your participation in the community. And that's, you know, we, we've looked at Block Science and, and Zargum and they're talking about source cred right? So maybe it's not the government, government rating you, maybe it's not the Chinese social credit score, but it's like, what is your rate ranking within the community um, based on how many popes you have, how many proof of participation and the token economies in the classrooms, the behavioral economies in the classrooms in PBIS and the social emotional learning and the gamification of all that is getting the kids ready for that. Okay, so now you get points zinged to you by red whatever red critter or what have you or on you know class dojo but soon it's going to be that you're getting your participation points from your in community and these people are at least in physical proximity to one another like they went i think and physically relocated to montenegro but in the future you're not going to be in physical proximity it's going to be a totally dig different and digital environment and what zargum was saying is that you could um 
put in different weighting mechanisms based on your personal preferences to rate people in your community and make, you know, people like evaluate people in your digital community to identify people with whom you would have a rapport, right? Like some sort of weird community dating app, like not a, you know, platonic, but like, who are the people that I want to surface the people that I should talk to, right? In this group who are reputable, who have that. And then maybe at some point my preferences change and I can tweak the algorithm and resurface new people or different people that that, that source cred model is, is in, integrated into the protocol layer. And, you know, again, with Awaki, what he's saying is these protocols are using us to self-propagate, right? Like who's in control? Are we in control of the protocol or is the protocol in charge of us? And who's evolving? What's evolving first? Is the protocol evolving? Is it evolving us? Like, are we evolving it? Like, I, it's totally unclear. Yeah. We're the ones being coded. <laughs> yeah, know. but we think we're the coders, you know? Right, exactly. Lynn? For now, we're the coders until it codes, yeah. Yeah, until it completely. Well, that's that's what's so funny about like all the people that are like on the front lines of like you know helping to build this thing. They think it's their ideas. They think it's their values that are going to be embedded in this thing, and then they'll you know they'll admit, oh yeah, there's these venture capitalists and these big banks and these big corporations, and oh yeah, the the military is involved and who knows who else. But MK like Ultra, no, but but it's. Doc. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's our i but but our ideas are the ones that are going to to rise above and this is really a this is really a system that's going to improve uh humanity and 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 ecology. I mean it, it's the the level of naivety is is just beyond the pale. They just want a nice story. They yeah. Nice story. They they want a nice story, but you you're just going to ignore all these all these f like pretty significant facts. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It kind of blows my mind. So, uh, yeah, here's, uh, this so lady. If you, if you have a pray. <laughs> okay. So can I, can we, can we, before we start with Alicia, can you pull up the little clip that has a little bit of her background? Uh, uh the tab, I think it is. It, oh, it's on the, one of the tabs. Okay. I think, yeah, there we go. Oh. So, yeah, so this is a bio from the Georgetown University Center for Clinical Bioethics. Uh, and she is a scholar. It's, her LinkedIn is kind of limited, um, but so she's affiliated with this Georgetown Bioethics Program. Um, and it says that her, her research focuses on complex systems, models of neural processes involved in proto-moral, moral and ethical cognition, emotions and behaviors. And so what's coming, going to be melding with the free market economy is the moral economy, right? And we've talked about some of that, like with Drucker. So the morality, right? And and even the pre-bunking and the, I don't know, Jason, who was the, the guy that was talking about like information, oh. not dis pre-bunking, pre-bunking. How could you forget Sander van der Linden? <laughs> <laughs> Sander van der Linden, yeah, right. So managing our neural processes around these like moral systems and in, in, um, in, in various social contexts. Um, and it's in, so here she says her ongoing research in neurophilosophy is focused on the causal role of context sensitive constraints in the emergence of mental events such as intentions. And she hits on this a lot, the importance of context. And so again, in the present context, like we're all outliers, we are all problematic outliers, even though we're dealing with like really important factual information that we're trying to get into people's consciousnesses, like the social context is that that cannot be allowed at this stage, right? And so we are probably dangers to that system. But the context sensitivity of morality, that's, that's gonna be governed by the protocol. Um, so she's written a couple of books with MIT Publishing and uh, let's see, uh, the chair of the Council Committee on State Programs. Uh, she's connected to a lot of public health projects. Um, and she actually has a, uh, a company called Vector Analytica that's looking at data analytics in public health issues, including vector-based disease like malaria and dengue. Uh, so modeling software of health incidents. And she's originally from Cuba and she has, it says she's born in Cuba and played a leading role in introducing complexity theory to that island nation. So I think a lot of what, what went down in Cuba during the lockdowns probably had a lot to do with Ms. Uh, uh, Juarero, Dr. Juarero. Um, so bioethics, morality, complexity, social context, 
uh, and public health and then data analytics vector analysis. So this is all really important stuff. And again, thank you to the people who brought her to my attention and also you know, Benjamin, uh, because these are two very interesting players whose uh, research areas shed a lot of additional light on complexity. So if, if you have a prey predator relationship, so you have gazelles and lions, um, over time they made each other faster or, or so the fact that they're sort of become codependent and, and that their evolution becomes intertwined actually makes them a system in themselves that then within the wider environment uh, gave them some advantages. Right. So what you just said about the grass of the horses is a similar thing. So in a sense, yes, they were competing and they might still be competing for some resource, but they're all, the competition becomes more of a collaborative right, right, right. nature. And I think that is in the nature of the problem with boundaries and complex systems. In, in Newtonian systems, you have nice clear boundaries, right? They're kind of walls. Uh, and, and that fits in very nicely with Aristotelian logical categories, right? They're very clearly bounded. In complex, adapt, especially complex adaptive system, because of these feedback relationships, they are more like membranes. The boundaries are more are porous. They're more like membranes that are, that, whose behavior is governed by a set of rules or algorithms. Instead of having walls, you've got passports, right? <laughs> or visas, correct? I mean, that, that's a big change, yeah. correct? Instead of putting a moat in front of a medieval castle and a wall, right? You start using passports. But what that means is you've got rules that regulate the functioning of those membranes or those boundaries. So two things. I thought at the beginning it was interesting. It was a bit disconnected from the, the other piece about the passports, but that competition uh, creates interdependencies in systems that might take the systems to a new level. So I think in the space of education, uh, education systems or even uh, health systems, like uh, the competition built into, I don't know, like the office fitness program where everybody's supposed to lose weight or whatever, or the school programs, when you put people into competition, it like raises the bar, right? And, and that's going to be done with intention through the protocol layer. So that I think is an interesting observation that that brings up. But then she pivots into this organismic aspect of that we're not having a, a solid wall or something that's very stable and clear cut. We're going to have something that's more porous and that allows inclusion, just like you were saying, Jason, or exclusion, um, who gets included, who gets excluded, that can change dynamically based on sensor technology, based on incoming data flows. Uh, sometimes maybe something can swell and get bigger, and then in, in different conditions, it will shrink and get smaller. And that that dynamic will, will happen at the intersection of the protocol rules, and those are the game mechanics, and the sensor information that is coming in. And that's that's a more of a bio, biological. That's what Guerrero brings to it is that I was really fixated for a long time on the transformation of biology into physics. And I do think that there are a lot of scientists who are really focused on biology and applying mathematical models to biology. But the counterpoint is the idea of looking at the, the dynamic nature of biology and working back from that. And, and that's what she brings to the table, which I think is quite interesting. Um, uh, so, you know, the passporting and especially saying visa of all things like, yeah, yeah, visas. And these guys are literally saying like, yeah, we've got a pop up community with a pop up passport that's dynamic. It's the same thing. And it's it, it, what it, what we're what we're what they're not saying out loud. Like her framing is mostly within a um, a corporate consulting a management consulting construct. If you just listen to her, it would sound like she's just going to apply this to some Fortune 500 C-suite executives, right? But we know it's not just that. And it, and it isn't because clearly she's also involved in public health vector analytics and other things, that, that these strategies are going to be applied in, in a much bigger way. There was a story that's just coming out, like Democracy Now! did a piece on it, which is just totally misframed, of course. But um, about Prospera. Democracy because, Later. 
<laughs> exactly. But Prospera is one of these special economic zones that's really bit that's really built around like a digital like a digital nation. But it's a digital la- nation that sits on it's top of phys- physical land and with people living there. And a lot of the people are like, so you talk about these pop up pop up things. You know, this pop up thing happened on top of somebody else that are like, hey, wait a minute, like we don't really <laughs> we don't agree to this pop up thing. Well, you know, where's your where's your passport? You know. You know, where's your digital passport? Uh, it'd be interesting, too, to look at, like, the indigenous people, like how they had to, you know, how they had to get uh, documentation. You know, they had to, there's right. all, of, all of that. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to, to go into on that, on that one. And that was linked to rations, right, on the reservation system. You would have these cards that you would have to show to get the quotient of rations because they had been removed off of their original lands where they had their, their own sustainable way of, you know, feeding their families in, into an artificial atmosphere where they could no longer do that and were dependent on the government. And that's the UBI model, right? <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay, so the next, we'll just go to the next one. Timing is extremely important and complex systems usually are characterized by oftentimes timing. So when you think of a kick you know, kids learn to kick on playground swings and they learn that the timing is really important to get the swing to swing. The point I'm trying to make is that a timing is a constraint. It is not an efficient cause. The timing does not impart more energy into the process than the kick itself. Here's another example. The vasculature of an organism, you know, our, our blood and lymphatic network does not impart energy directly. It merely channels and organizes that energy flow, but it is not an efficient cause. And in particular, catalysts and feedback are very important. What they do is they link separate and independent processes such that they become conditional on one another. That's obvious in chemistry, right? Or in feedback, the, cir- the circularity of iteration or recursion or feedback loops links the output back to the beginning of the next stage of the process. So I think that the thing for me is the conditionality, like that's the smart contract layer. And the token engineering. So, you know, the these these folks talk about almost like setting up a SimCity type of simulation and then letting it run. Like you set the parameters and you let it run. You have the conditionality and you've got the feedback loops. That that's the cybernetic. Yeah. So if you've got everything that's yeah. running on impact finance, uh, data driven, uh, you know, show me the numbers. What is what, what? What put it on a leaderboard? Let's let what? What is the metrics? What is your starting point? What is your ending point? Um, that's part of this feedback loop cycle that is like gearing things up, right? Th- that is why we're seeing everything. It's like this is the reason. So the what works government, the cradle to career, the impact finance, that why does school turned into just like a misery of data, like you know, children being. Sub- forced into free labor to create digital data trails, you know, to run these systems. It's because that's the coordination mechanism in the protocol layer. The the machine can't run unless it's fed in the language that it understands, which is the data analytics and is the feedback looping of like what works, what didn't work, what works, what didn't work. We're all part of that optimization program, which is is the the eugenics piece. Um, And then the other piece is like timing. And I think that the timing is, again, Several times throughout, she talks about composing, orchestrating. There is a flow to the music. And I mean, I know you guys are so much Mm -hmm. more tapped into that than I am, but there is something about the tempo, the timing, the rhythm, the even an orchestral composition of, so you run this and then you bring this idea back in, right? And then you run it some more and then you bring, like those feedback loops are part of like musical compositions, themes, right? You've got themes, you've got sub themes, you bring them in and you organize it as a landscape of sound, like a sound and emotional, like a consciousness memory scape of, of through music. And to me, that's, it's all interconnected. I think of like the political stage, the political theater is kind of that. They're mm. like, oh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to swing it over here and swing it over here. There's like, there's like this whole 
dance that's going on mm -hmm. here that's yeah, that's that's, that's like pendulum. test testing the temperature pendulum. of people and then they're like you know okay we're gonna do obama now now we're gonna oh we're gonna bring trump in now okay now we're gonna bring but you know it's almost like this whole thing of like you know th there's yes. i think there's t there's an attempted homeostasis political mm -hmm. homeostasis right there but anyway yeah that's a good point but it's so believable uh to if okay so she talked about the um the feedback loop so she there's the catalyst and then the the feedback loop the circularity or whatever word she used look at that symbol that they've got with the it says boundary boundary list and she's got the infinity symbol there mm -hmm. it's interesting that the name is boundary list so she doesn't want any boundaries what they're doing they don't want any boundaries but they want to create these boundaries for us within these uh, camps or these teams where within those there are the feedback loops so you've got this that triggers this and that that triggers that and the response that you get when when talking about the political landscape absolutely it's like trigger events and i i i think they do that like with texas for example because we've had uh the the whole debate or the whole campaign you know with beto versus abbott and um and the the um creates that well every campaign creates that you know left right it seems like but yes you've got hillary and then you've got trump and then you know the and then within those those uh, primaries you got to have the fighting then and then they come together it just goes it's repeat rinse repeat constant yeah when there and are the catalyst the idea of the catalyst a catalytic event the catalyst is huge right? Like th that th they understand it as chemical. Like when you hit these conditions, then these things come together and that they, they, I think they have planned out a playlist of events. Like I'm sure that they have subplots and backup plans and different things, but they're just like dominoes. They just fall. And then there are these certain trigger triggers that move in. So I know that we're running out of time. Well, and the weather is like that. I know we yeah. talk, we like to talk. Well, I was we thinking like too, we could do, we could, because we have a lot more clips. If we want, we could try to schedule another one of these and do it in two parts. And then yeah, maybe, no, get, I think that would maybe be we can good. get Leo back. Yeah, yeah, I think that would but be But we good. can go a little can bit more. I can go a little bit more. There's one yeah, more that, that I would like to show. No, no, we, we need to end. Ecology, the energy. Okay. Like, and I don't know. Can you scroll down a little bit more? Yeah. I don't know why I put it so far at the end. Um, it is, it's that, the way I'm going to, uh, no. Is that it? Is it number 25? Look, look under the uh, contextual terrain. Yeah. It? So maybe we could, you want to close on this one? Okay. It and I'll kind close of fits. with this image because I really. Oh, okay. And I'll close with so, this image. Yeah. So, so I just want to open with this. Um, I can, I can readjust the playlist so we'll keep track of it. But so she's, she's talking about this image and it's from this guy Wadlington, I think, from maybe the 1920s or 30s. And now he knew people like J.D. Bernal. And Bernal was the guy that, um, you know, we should put your brain in a cylinder with some liquid and live through haptics. And he wrote that in the 1920s. He was a, a high level crystallographer with the UK government. <laughs> and um, so he was part of this milieu, even though it might seem odd. This is a very old diagram. It's probably 100 years old by now. Um, maybe not quite, but close to it. And and she calls it an epigenetic landscape. And so on it is a ball um, at the top and there's a slope with like a ripple, rippled landscape. And this is these energy gradients when um, Awaki, was it Awaki? Who was talking about like the uh, incentives, like the incentive structure in the protocol layer. And so she's very fixated on the um, the physics. The materialist is that, you move things by pushing them, by putting energy into the system, where co in complexity, you don't put new energy in, but you contour the landscape, which to me seems like it would take energy. So I'm not sure how that exactly works, but you create the conditions that make that preference the outcome that you want, the actions that you want. Um, and then that would be done through shaping the doing the token engineering. So on the one hand, you've got a ball, which would be us as an agent, or it doesn't necessarily even need to be an individual. It could be a society. It could be a, a designated guild, you know, pursuing a quest that that could be the ball. And then you're, 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 you want the landscape to operate a certain way to get the ball to a certain destination that that's predetermined that the ball might not even know that that's the predetermined destination. So in the image adjacent to it, 
it, you're looking as if you're under the rippled landscape to see what's propping it up, like where the hills are and where the valleys are. And there are these systems of sort of vector lines that are propping it up almost like you could um, play those lines like a harp or like a guitar to pull them down or push them up. Um, there's this, you know, if, if you are sort of steampunky and there are pneumatics or something in that, like you could play the strings underneath the terrain to guide the ball in the direction. And then the ball might just be rolling and following the path of least resistance and not really even knowing that, like, it's feeling like it has agency in the system, but it's not realizing that, oh, over the next horizon, the, 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 the terrain has totally changed based on your past behavior. You know what I mean? Like, you, and by the time you get to that horizon, you don't know that it was different an hour ago, <laughs> like before your data went into the system. It's just the next horizon to get you to the next phase. And, you know, as as someone who is, you know, undergoing sort of radical life transitions now, you just sort of wonder, like, am I in a game? Am I in the simulation? Like, am I in charge of my land? Like steering myself or the landscape or is the landscape steering me? Like, it's unclear. So, um you know, I just, to me, this image is really significant. And I, I go back to having this, you know, in your life, you have this sort of collection of images. And sometimes looking back, you're like, did that really happen? Did that happen the way I remember it? But me having a conversation with my thesis advisor, and I was at Penn getting my master's in historic preservation, and I was writing my thesis on cultural landscapes, which is context and looking at layers of these landscapes from 18th century healing hot springs, which is interesting, all the way to 19th century industrial structures and um, then in, including graph, uh, graphite and, and then and to now into sort of a suburban corporate industrial landscape. And so and she looked at me and she said, Allison, like and she, she's this older she was this older German woman, uh, an immigrant, and she had white hair that was just sort of like the Glenda, the, you know, the good witch or something and walking down Walnut Street next to Penn. And she's saying, like, you'll see it someday. You'll see it. And you're she said, I also said your family will be OK because you see it now, my family seems to be increasingly at distance from me, which makes me sad, but maybe I'll just take her word for it, that they'll be okay because I can see it. And I never would have ever guessed in a million years that my work on the Pickering Valley Railroad, for goodness sake, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, like would lead me to understanding this Wadlington cultural landscape of cybernetic tokenomics, you know, like in, it, within a game, game mechanics, data-driven game mechanic environment. It's just, so. Yeah. Well, one thing I noticed about the image on the right, the B, uh, the B, um, is I, I've really yeah. been kind of fascinated with uh, pulleys, uh, you um, know, yeah. and so I've really been getting into pulleys because like, it's kind of crazy. Like if you have like, you can lift like a truck by yourself if you have enough pulleys like the more pulleys you have like the more power you have like if okay. you like if you hook that's why people love to use pulleys because you could you could hook a rope up have a pulley have another pulley have a pulley and for some reason it, it like distributes the the energy or whatever and mm. like the more pulleys you have the less energy it takes to lift that like the lift mm. whatever you're lifting over here so this okay. looks like a big pulley system and then looking at how like one thing one one piece of the landscape can be connected to another piece of the landscape. So like, think about the social landscape. Someone's right. pulling in this direction, but they can be connected to a whole bunch of other things that is just automatically shifting the, the landscape. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. anyways, that's just well, kind of- One of the things in the guy who was doing the risk analysis stuff and the work domain analysis, what he said is we want to look for points of inflection right, where you can have an outsized impact. We wanna identify those points. Like we wanna know which rope to pull to get the most bang for our buck mm -hmm. in this. And the other piece of the pulley yeah. and how this looks, it looks entangled. And so the complexity people in Snowden, they talk about it like a bramble. Like the one thing is, is like, you know, things are attached to other things and you don't always know when you tug on the thing all the other pieces that are going to follow along, which I mean, I can vouch for that as a research person. Sometimes you pull the thread and you have no idea all the other stuff that's tangled up into that thread that you just, you know, naively start tugging on. Yeah. Yeah. And the, so invert that. Well, I, I see a couple of things on image A. I'm thinking of the pinball wizard, you know, that mm -hmm. who song. I think it, it looks like a pinball machine. And so depending on how, uh, you know, it goes through the, the maze of things and you can just, you can, depending on your skill or the wizard, how they're going to direct that ball. Uh, but the 
looking at the image B and thinking about, you know, often when you're talking about connecting or making the connections and connecting the dots with all of these people and institutions and, and the maps that you make that sometimes people will respond with that image of the guy pulling with, with the red, the, the murder board, you know, with the red string. Oh, yeah. And they're, yeah. they're mocking us when they say that, mm-hmm. but if you do invert this, then it, it it's, um, that is exactly what, what we're looking at. So it may not look like it's connected to the average person, but when you understand all of these different triggers and different nudges and um, initiatives or agendas, then you, they, they are connected and whether they know it or not, it is. Right. And, and so we've just, we've just shown uh, those, the cause and effect of that. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, I think if we can set aside blame or um, uh, judging everybody that's involved, which again, it's not easy to do. And I'm not saying I'm the best at it. And, you know, clearly I didn't know that that was an option. Like, but when you can put that down of assigning, like they know and they're bad or how bad are they or how much do they know or are they controlled op, which is a word I don't use and, you know, all of these things. And I'm like, well, if what it is, is in a complex system things are so entangled that like, there's almost like little pegs holding down these different strings. Like you, you don't really know what's a couple degrees removed from you and, and, and the game mechanics incentivize you to simply do your job. Right. And, and, and meet the metrics of doing a good job so you can get a raise and make a down payment on a house and whatever, you know, and retire and, you know, and go to Hawaii or something like, like the game mechanics are incentivized that you're not going to explore around where your string connects to. And so I, I think that that is really useful in terms of, again, when we get into a blame game or a hysteria game, it, it makes it harder to sort of just look at with like level, like levelness at like, oh, it really looks like this, right? Like, and do, did we agree to this? Like, can we talk about what this looks like, what the unintended consequences of this are, what it means for our agents, our actual agency, like given by God as, a, you know, creatures on this earth to have you know, an experience that we, we pursue our own pathway as opposed to being steered on a cybernetic pathway. Yeah. yeah well said. And I'll it also looks like an image. MC Escher. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'll close with this image because I really like it. This is a standard epigenetic landscape that Conrad Waddington um, formulated, I don't know, 50s, 40s, I don't know. But imagine if you only thought in terms of energetic power relations. All people would think of is pushing the, the ball here to counteract gravity and try to get it over this hump. But if you look at the right-hand image, you realize that it's all these underlying constraints that are creating the landscape that if you were able to adjust the constraints that produce the landscape, you would change the topology of the landscape and the system might go in the direction that you wanted it to. So the suggestion that complex system has is you're better off trying to manage an ongoing complex system by focusing on the constraints that underpin or subtend the obvious surface phenomena than it is to try to change it through powers. Yeah. So to me, that was just everything. Like when I got to the point and I saw that diagram, I'm like, that's it. That's that takes it to the next level. Again, it doesn't necessarily upend the ideas. I mean, I I would say what she brings to it is this idea of it's not just physics. Um, shoving physics and biology into physics. It's actually applying biology as an overlay on that. And, um, and I would, I would say if anyone's looking for an interesting movie to watch, my friend Wendy sort of encouraged me to watch this old David, David Cronenberg, is that his name? David Cronenberg, um, movie called Existence and it's E X I S T E N Z Z on the end, as opposed to existence with a C. And it's, it's like 20 years old. Well, I think it was like 1999 or 2000, but it's about extended reality, like this virtual reality game. And, um, you know, it's, 
in, in biological computing, like a huge piece of it is these, these organic, because Cronenberg's sort of gross with their whole, his whole body, like goopy body kind of stuff. And that they, they grow the, these biological components for the gaming consoles, which plug in through a u, u, umbilical cord type of cord to a socket at the base of your spine. They put a portal in the, at the base of your spine, which is also like chakra and Masonic and all of that sort of stuff. And you plug in the, the umbilical cord and your body runs the gaming console. But these the, the pieces of the console, which looks sort of like, like nipples and different things, like it's not mechanical looking. And as we understand it, we're grown in synthetically engineered organisms like amphibians and different weird creatures. And then they would take them apart and then use the the ver various bodily biology parts of those things to make the gaming consoles. And so again, it's this, I think that what we're moving towards is organic computing. Like we're moving away from something that looks like a silicon chip with little lines and da, 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 like in math and hard shapes. This next phase of optical computing, light-based computing, other things, I think is going to look more biological. It's going to yeah. look more fungal. It's going to look more bacterial. It's going to slime mold, all of that. It's good. The computing is going to start to transition and, and we probably need to get it in our heads that, that that's underway because they're going to steer us there. Well, they say they want the technology to be invisible. I mean, at, at, at a certain yeah. point, you, you'll, you'll, you won't even see the technology. It won't be, it, it, it won't even be visible to you. Yeah. Well, I Thank think that was a good, it. yeah, we, we did a good run. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot more clips, so I think we'll just come back and do um, we'll do another round. Uh, and and I'm going to be bopping off to Seattle uh, middle of next week, so uh, might be a week or so before I get all situated. But well, we, that's a, that we, that's enough for people to to start on. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, for... we can do on that. And we can put right. when, once this goes, we'll we'll run it. I, I'm sure we can stream it at some point. Um, and I can put the link to the, uh, all of the, uh, playlist if people want to go back through them themselves. And so I, I sort of curated it in a way I thought the ideas flowed from one to the next. Yeah. I thought it was well, well organized. Done. Yeah. I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. <laughs> it's starting to come together. Uh, well, thank you too. Uh, Make it go away. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But I think if we can understand it, we can neutralize it. Because again, she was about intent, right? Morality, contextual morality and intention. Like I think having a good heart and having a clear eyes and being strong, right? Like having a strength of our, what we understand as right and true and good. And again, we don't have to make the other people super evil geniuses because they're probably just like one little pulley string under there and they really don't know what they're connected to. Yeah. But I think we can. There is this mm -hmm. butterfly effect. Like if there is something where they're looking for the the, the sweet spot that's going to have, you know, a big outsized impact, like we, we just keep showing up and being the consistent voices. And then at some point, it's I think it's going it, to, it, we're, we're going to be drawing you know, even if it's not us particularly, but I think that the ideas that we're putting out will become more, more understood as things develop. Yeah. yeah. At some point, we're it's, supposed it's to pray be... for our enemies and there. Yeah. Sorry. No, you're fine. I know it's hard. It's hard when you got that delay. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lynn. <laughs> uh, I just said we can pray for our enemies and there's a verse about pouring hot coals on them. Uh, neutralizing uh some of what's what's out there that is wicked and bad but i it doesn't i don't think singularity and all of these things when in the end it doesn't happen it doesn't really happen it's just the illusion that it's going right. to yeah I, I think that their 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 dream their vision is is not possible i don't think it's possible um i, I no. think that but i think they're going to no. do a lot of damage trying to make it happen though and it's 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 tragic because i actually don't think the people i don't even think this woman mm -hmm. is a bad person i don't think they want to do harm uh i i don't think that they actually know what it is that they're actually doing <laughs> <laughs> uh in in a bigger sense but anyway all right well till next time thanks you two all right bye, bye everybody see you guys